good afternoon very good afternoon to you all thank you thank you so now our president president has joined so we can proceed ahead uh yeah. we are we are waiting for mp singh sahab and uh, no uh, extremely sorry extremely sorry and uh, shukla sahab just uh, we are calling yeah, yeah. okay yes, and the, the audience is already 60 per full yeah dananjay is so famous so, so much love by hey, mp singh sahab aa gaye sir admit kar dijiye sir main the mp singh sahab aa gaye namaskar sir नमस्कार वेलकम सर वेलकम नमस्कार नमस्कार सबको नमस्कार नाइस टू यू सर सी यू सर माय प्लेजर माय प्लेजर और कैसे हैं सब ठीक है आप लोग ठीक हो बिल्कुल बिल्कुल एकदम सर आपके ब्लेसिंग से सर सब डॉक्टर वेलकम 17 ईयर यंग <laughs> मैं तो 75 यंग हो गया डीएम बैनर्जी सर विल बी आल्सो या या ही वाज सो एक्टिव अभी इंसा वाले मीटिंग में या एंड पार्टी साहब योर ओन पार्टी साहब पार्टी साहब या या एग्जैक्टली मिश्रा साहब कैसे है सिंह साहब वीपी मिश्रा इज ओके अभी आएंगे अभी आ रहे होंगे ठीक है अच्छा 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 ओके सर वीपी मिश्रा सर अभी तो नागपुर कल ही बात हुई उनसे वो कल कल था लखनऊ में तो उसमें थे आप भी तो थे राइट आ रहे हैं बहुत स्कोप है धनंजय जियो टूरिज्म में पेलेंटोलॉजी का या 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 सर यही तो डिफरेंट फोरम्स में हम लोग डिस्कस करने कोशिश कर रहे हैं एमपी सिंह साहब इस जगह एंड दैट आपने तो बहुत कोशिश की है भाई मैं वो एक अच्छा फ्रूटफुल रहा सर वी आर वेटिंग बट देन इट्स इट्स गुड हां एटलीस्ट एक बहुत बढ़िया हुआ है वो एंड एंड कंसर्न विद द सब्जेक्ट पता नहीं कितने जीएसआई वाले ज्वाइन करेंगे वर्षा बोलिए मैं ज्वाइन हां हां दैट इज गुड Seventy two. Great. Sanjay, you are waiting for century, is it? Sir, so we are waiting for two more minutes. We are waiting for uh, Dr. Shukla sir. He is going to join within two minutes. Then we will start. Yeah. Okay. Can any student uh, speak out? डबल फोर दो सागर लखनऊ कोई भी विद्यार्थी कुछ बोले एक्चुअली वी वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स हियर एंड दैट्स व्हाई डॉक्टर ने आज मी टू आई शेयर्ड विद ऑल द ऑल माय फ्रेंड्स बेंगलोर को भी बोला पता नहीं कॉलेजेस ऑन होंगे तो नागपुर वाले कितने है पता नहीं देवी का नागपुर है वगैरह वगैरह स्टूडेंट्स तो होंगे फ्रॉम टुडे देयर आर हॉलीडेज सर एक्चुअली दिवाली वेकेशंस आर स्टार्टेड नो फ्रॉम टुडे ये सर भी लोग वेकेशन में ही हां आई डोंट नो व्हाट स्टूडेंट्स के आई थिंक बिकॉज़ ऑफ दिवाली हॉलीडेज स्टूडेंट्स शुड बी नॉट देयर मच आप टीचर्स लोग सर स्टूडेंट के साइकोलॉजी जानते हैं हम लोग तो डर के मारे अटेंड करते थे नंबर नहीं मिले नाउ देयर आर 82 पार्टिसिपेंट्स आई थिंक नो वी आर आल्सो टेलीकास्टिंग ऑन इट ऑन YouTube सो दैट अदर्स कैन आल्सो अटेंड ऑल फ्रॉम नागपुर पराग दलाल वगैरह कोई नहीं है हां शुक्ला साहब जियोलॉजी वाले अपने आप को अलग सोचते हैं इस इवेंट के सेवन में प्लीज अनम्यूट सर शुक्ला सर 
सेवेंटी सेवन में बहुत स्टूडेंट्स होंगे ना उन्हें सर आरती भगेले यश नशीद खान पठान सर एक्चुअली टेक फोर स्टूडेंट्स दे आर ऑन द वे योर यू आर ऑन द वे टू देयर होम सो दे आस्क मी दैट दे विल बी जॉइनिंग एज सुन एज दे विल रीच देयर होम फंक्शन Uh, professor m p singh president paleontological society of india guest of honor of the today's program dr sudhir sukla vice president paleontological society of india dr ak chatterjee president gondwana geological society nagpur dr r b choudhary president alumni association of post graduate department of geology nagpur university dr bandana samant and dr samaya humne organizing secretaries of International Fossil Day Program 2022. Speakers of the today's program: uh, Dr. D. M. Mohabe, former Deputy Director, DYDG GSI, Nagpur Central Region; Dr. Sajjad Azruddin, Nagoya University, Japan; Dr. Arvindam Chakraborty, Institute of Earth Sciences, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. Uh, I could see the large number of other uh, distinguished uh, participants. Dr. Sarokar Sahab, Dr. Datta Sahab, Dr. Partha Sathi Sahab, and oh, so many others I can see on my screen. So all other distinguished guests who have joined today's uh, program online, faculty members of the uh, department and uh, all geology departments and other departments, research scholars, students, and friends, welcome you all for the today's program. The Paleontological Society of India, Nagpur Student Chapter. in association with the gondwana geological society and post graduate department of uh, alumni association post graduate department of geology nagpur university are jointly uh, celebrating today's international fossil day 2022 so friends ifd is an annual celebration mainly highlighting its scientific and educational value of paleontology and the importance of preservation of fossils for future generations fossils are not merely useful for their morphological studies but play a very significant role in resolving various earth and environmental science related problems so with the advent of technology a lot of research has been carried out using microfossils on various emerging issues uh, in today's scenario such as you no know, isotope studies especially the clumped isotope studies for paleo temperature estimation where we could Uh, be able to understand the past temperature with the accuracy of plus minus 2 degree centigrade so such type of uh, techniques are nowadays available so using the micro fossil test and uh, you know cell walls we can study such isotopes these isotopes are also very significant to study the paleo altitudinal measurement and tectonic activities etc so micro fossils are uh, well known for the for their implications in the monsoonal studies paleo monsoonal studies and no there are possible attempts uh, to uh, interpret to forecast the future monsoonal trends may be at the interdecadal level to the decadal level so the, these micro fossils are very much significant in the geo archaeological studies nowadays so geo archaeological problems uh, um, are resolved using the micro fossils at various instances so impact of climate change on the civilizations using uh, you know the, the micro fossils again it is the burning topic so people all over the world across the world you know they are focusing on the micro fossils uh, on such uh, important issues so in the petroleum industry in the hydrocarbon industry you know with the advent of the technology like bio steering using the uh, micro fossils foraminifera and other groups of micro fossils bio steering and the basin analysis they are been car carried out done studied using the petroleum um, uh, the micro fossils these micro fossils are very much sensitive to environmental variables like ph salinity temperature so therefore they have been uh, used nowadays 
in the newly emerged branch, what we call it as environmental micropalaeontology, to study the pollution and other related issues. So, no, uh, so students should know that the new uh, trends are there, new applications are there, so we can use these microorganisms, microfossils, to resolve these very much important issues, uh, uh, which is directly related to uh, the society. Societal problems are resolved using these uh, microfossils. So, uh, the branches like molecular micropalaeontology, is a, again, it is one of the emerging branches in the paleontology field of the microfossils. One of the important uh, topic to be studied not only on the Earth, for the extraterrestrial uh, bodies like Mars and other uh, people are trying to study the especially, you know, uh, mm -hmm. interesting hypothesis there now. People may be knowing about that. That is the RNA molecule study. So how these RNAs are used to study the origin of life? That is very, very important and emerging. Uh, you know, uh, now study hypotheses are proposed and people are working on those hypotheses. Microfossils and other fossils, the biogeochemistry, again, it is uh, one of the important aspects to be studied. So there are large number of new applications are coming out uh, with the help of these fossils and the microfossils. We can resolve those earth science related problems, geological problems, environmental problems. So I hope that to, uh, today's deliberations will generate the awareness of fossils, their importance and their implications in the field of the geosciences. This program, again, it will be uh, helpful uh, in knowing various emerging applications of this uh, in Earth. I think you know, uh, due to the time constraint, I may not be able to talk more on this, but uh, today's talk, certainly they are going to help our students, researchers to think upon, to ponder, uh, ponder over the uh, newer uh, branches of the microfossils where they can work uh, for their research and you know, for, for their studies. So thank you very much for your presence. Uh, I think uh, uh, with this, uh, I stop here and I welcome you all once again uh, for your presence in the today's uh, program. So with this, uh, thank you. Now I invite the president of the Gondwana Geological Society, Dr. A.K. Chatterjee Sahab to kindly uh, take your words. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, respected uh, everybody in the forum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, it is a matter of pride uh, for the Gondwana Geological Society to be associated with this uh, online program, along with the uh, paleontologists of repute and uh, also the alumni association is here. So, it is a matter of pride for us to be associated on this auspicious day. And uh, I would like to just uh, say that the International Paleontological Association, uh, they say that it is uh, uh, from the USA. It is a uh, creative way to spread awareness and importance of fossils and their prevention amongst all enthusiasts and uh, uh, generally the students and uh, the public, etc. So it is their way of celebrating the uh, in, uh, International Fossil Day. So it was started. Mr. Namaskar. Uh, this was uh, started in the Mr. US. Mr. Namaskar. Uh, please uh, switch off your uh, microphone. Uh, this uh, Hello, Sir Ji. Namaskar. microphone and video. Video switch off, Karunga, please. Please uh, kindly switch off your video and uh, uh, speaker, please. Everybody. Achha, uh, speaker and uh, this uh, because Shinkar, sir, no, sir. Uh, please, please switch off. Mr. KM, uh, uh, please switch off your video. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Vanjaraka, sir. I think he is not. Uh, he, he cannot hear us, I think. Uh, so I will continue. Please. Sorry for the interruption. I will continue. So this uh, it was started as the National Fossil Day in the U.S. on 15, 10, 2010. Uh, this was during Earth Science Week. Uh, this was the, during uh, uh, the, this 13, 10, 2010 was during Earth Science Week in the U.S. where it was started 12 years ago uh, in a great big way, and it became uh, so very soon it became International. Uh, fossil Day because the International Paleontological Association of the U.S. they uh, declared it as such uh, along with so many fellow member countries and uh, uh, now in the U.S. 385 partners including museum institutions and others others join in their efforts to celebrate this in a big way. 
even in india we have started celebrating it in a big way it was very recently celebrated by the chennai university by the uh, also by the paleontological society of india and by many other uh, yeah, bodies uh, which have interest in paleontology so it is near it is a really a very good thing that we have recognized the importance of fossils very late uh, but uh, better late than never and we have started so uh, this uh, actually the uh, uh, since, since of student days we have been knowing uh, forum, forums and uh, diatoms as uh, economic uh, uh, means uh, for their economic use, potential and uses but uh, there is a there is a huge list of new uh, microfossils that have been added so that uh, means uh, it also means uh, brings into importance Uh, the, the other side of the fossils, uh, the uh, conventional importances are al- already there. Means uh, about which we have learned during our student days. We have been learning. Students are learning now. But apart from that, their uh, very I mean societal and uh, economic uses they have come uh, been highlighted and they are very much in uh, is uh, in uh, useful uh, like diatoms and foraminifera foraminifers. Uh, there are so many new fossils have been added to the list and another thing uh, from personal experience i would like to mention as a geologist uh, in the gsi i had uh, been a part of the as a participant and later on i organized uh, several exhibitions uh, uh, during various occasions say gsi foundation day or uh, one was this uh, uh, 50th year of independence 1997 so there are so many such experiences but uh, means uh, there were uh, all exhibits uh, paleontology then uh, your uh, petrology uh, and uh, all all sorts of exhibits maths etc were there the gsi work rather but uh, uh, i have specifically found that the general public they are attracted by the paleontological exhibits especially our uh, in nagpur we had the human skull hominid skull of 500000 years ago uh, 5 lakh years old Uh, from 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 the quaternary beds by dr arun sonakia and that was a star attraction everybody would come there the press and the tv cameras they would be focused on that they would ask details and whenever till sonakia sir was in service he used to come down and personally explain the means uh, uh, how he found it and what is the significance how important it is so uh, with all that means uh, paleontological exhibits are also very much eye catching and uh, for the general public and i think uh, the awareness should be spread more and more and uh, the this uh, fossil days uh, helping us in a big way to spread the message thank you everybody let us hope we'll have a very fruitful session thanks everybody for listening thanks thank you very much sir for detailed elaboration of the fossil day program worldwide so thank you very much for your uh, encouraging talk uh, so now we have with us dr sudhir shukla sir Uh, he is the vice president of paleontological society of india he was formerly there in the o- 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 ongc as a deputy general manager uh, so i would like to request uh, dr sudhir shukla sir to speak uh, on this occasion uh, thank you professor homne it's a matter of great pride right for paleontological society of india as well as to me that we have been really uh, very nicely coordinating and organizing this fossil international fossil day rather i would say that international fossil week which is now it's spreading to more than 6 7 days and uh, to start with uh, i am really thankful to dr anjan chatterjee is the head uh, president of the gondwana geological society professor m p singh who is the president of paleontological society of india uh, prof uh, dr mohabe i am seeing him dr banjar watkar and so many other dignitaries along with the obviously professor homne uh, and samaya professor samaya who have been very active and who have really taken pains to organize it in nagpur for this year as well as the organizers in last two years it's a really when we started with it we really thought that it should be the knowledge about or the awareness about the paleontology should be spread to the younger lot maybe right up to the school children level because and yesterday we had experience here in our gsi program that we invited school children also who were absolutely enthusiastic and they showed a lot of interest in even in the talk as well as in the museum uh, 
visit and so many so that's the that's the area where we have to really target besides the ug students ug students already they are half cooked so they very readily grasp things and they really uh, they are the future uh, say maybe i should say the paleontologist who can contribute in the energy sector as well as in the other economic mineral sector see over the years when i worked in it was my experience that it was very difficult to bring in people first in paleontology and then to let them continue or let them just uh, say <laughs> struck to the and uh, this the experience of uh, all industries world over that the experience lot have really gone away they have retired they are not very active and the younger lot and the, uh, there is a huge gap of age and experience between the younger lot and the experience lot so it's high time in india also we have been trying under the leadership of psi that uh, for last 5 years we have we have really done it in a very big way of course with the help of the, our regional chapters and the very enthusiastic regional coordinators and their teams i am really very thankful to all of them and uh, uh, i really see that there is a lot of interest which is uh, being developed in the students so i i wish that uh, uh, our effort get succeeded uh, of course our means is the regional coordinators and our own all, all combined i have all the best wishes for this uh, uh, deliberations and talks thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, shukla sir thank you very much shukla sir thank you very much bahut acha laga aap aaye and we could see there is a tremendous response from the students as well there are more than 100 participants already it is full so yes. we have requested them to join on youtube youtube so uh, so thank you very much sir for your talk uh, now finally i would like to request uh, president of the paleontological society of india uh, lucknow professor mp singh sir so kindly uh, please uh, enlighten us sir thank singh, you sir. thank you professor sumed humne uh, dr chatterjee vandana samant samaya humne ananjay mohabe sir learned speaker of the day whom we call the dinosaur man of india and dear students first of all i would like to express my gratitude to dr sumed dumne convener of this and his team for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you all since dr humne has already emphasized the significance of the fossils and their utilities i will not repeat it i'll just brief, briefly tell you that how uh, psi started this uh, organizing this uh, uh, international fossil day since 2016 we in india started observing international fossil day at the request of famous paleontologist of california university dr jerry lips paleontological society of india uh, took it seriously and under the able uh, leadership of dr sudhir shukla vice president of the society few student chapters were established at some important paleontological centers namely chennai delhi pune chandigarh nagpur jammu dehradun response was overwhelming i am happy to tell you that this year few new centers have come up like south bihar university gaya sikkim university dibrugarh university etc so it's very heartening to see that at least our efforts are being succeeded the main objective of, of international fossil day is to sensitize young students and common people regarding significance of fossils and to conserve fossil sites for posterity to establish fossil park and create geo heritage sites although government agencies are doing their bit but that is not enough unless until the local people residing near the fossil sites are engaged or explained about the importance of fossil preservation sites we in india have enormous scope for establishing fossil parks and geo heritage sites there are some famous fossil localities like in kutch bagbet jabua dhar district aryalur jaisalmer balasinor etc we have some fossil parks like akal fossil park of akal fossil wood park at jaisalmer saketi in himachal pradesh dinosaur fossil park at balasinor etc but we need more such parks and enough publicity should be done to attract common people towards the fossils 
with 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 the with these few words i want to again thank our organizers for inviting me to this function we all are are waiting to hear dr mohave the dinosaur man of india thank you thank you thank you very much sir uh, singh sir for your informative talk uh, thanks for your presence now i think uh, with your permission and permission of uh, president of the gondwana geological society uh, we would like to start the program singh sir shall we start yes sir please, 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 please. singh sir uh, thanks a lot for your uh, speech please thank uh, sir please thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you so now uh, before uh, dr mohabe saab uh, speaks no i would like to request dr samaya humne to kindly introduce uh, the speaker dr samaya good afternoon uh, respected delegates and uh, president dr mp singh sir vice president uh, dr shukla sir and uh, president of bondwana geological society dr ak chatterji sir uh, dr sarulkar sir and all other distinguished delegates and all participants uh, i i have given the responsibility to introduce our first speaker that is dr dhananjay mohit but i was trying to uh, get his uh, cv from internet but i failed because i just got two lines uh, cv and i asked his student that uh, kindly forward me at the ds but he still didn't forwarded me but uh, i think uh, he need no introduction because his email id that is dino mobes tell everything about him he has more than 30 years of experience uh, in research for dinosaurs in central india basically thar and uh, he is uh, one of the very prominent scientist working on dinosaurs of india so he retired as director deputy director general from gsi from the paleontology division central region nagpur and uh, rather uh, after retiring retiring also he is uh, doing many projects in association with national science academy of uh, us and also with uh, dr banda samant who is associate professor in department of geology at nagpur university so though he is retired but he is not uh, he is not ready to leave his uh, passion for the research and he is still continuing so i like to invite him to give his talk uh, dr mohabe sir please thank you dr alka hone indeed it's a matter of great pleasure for me to be invited and uh, make a presentation here and i am very happy to see so many distinguished uh, participants here dr mandeep um, um, pal singh sahab anjan chatterjee okay. sarul kar sumad humne sahab and ke datta sahab was there and many others are there and especially i am very happy that there are so many students who are here basically i was uh, asked by sumed humne to when i make my presentation because i have been speaking on this topic for a very well long i don't know how many presentations we have especially covid covid provided a lot many opportunities to make this and there are series of that but it's always good to be interacting with the students at just on 10th and 11th we had a meeting um, sponsored by ministry of earth sciences and in sa where again we were much bothered about the about the protection and maintenance of geo heritage and fossils and things like that it was it was a really good interaction and uh, coming to the point as uh, dr hune has asked me to uh, keep in uh, mind the interest of the students while structuring the uh, my talk i think i will go there is some time concerns and i may have to skip through some of these slides very quickly but uh, hope so i think i start here uh, i think sir please take your one hour time as uh, humne sir has uh, informed you okay, we will okay, short our uh, we, we will short our talk okay sir okay okay thank because you because many you. students are interested in uh, listening to dinosaurs कहा जा रहा है शेयर बोल रहा था मैं 
dinosaur is one area which is interesting even to the i think the littlest of children 2 3 years 4 years 5 years everybody knows dinosaurs and they are interested so it's a wonderful topic thanks to the rasik park picture yeah <laughs> rasik park that yeah. glamorized dinosaurs yeah. dinosaurs you know something uh, sorry just uh, no no it's okay Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying it. No problem. Okay. Make it full screen, sir. Full screen. Yeah. Can you see it? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. We can see. Okay. So this is just for the student because uh, not much to do. This is a presentation. It's a international fossil day IFD, and uh, we know by uh, by definition the fossils they are body parts of animals and plants and uh, their impressions and traces of their activities. Now IFD intent is to highlight the scientific and the educational values of paleontology and importance of preserving fossils and protecting fossil sites. So this is very important for the students who have to carry out this campaign onwards. and uh, be, be below this photograph which you you are seeing she is mary any the first woman to discover first fossil in the world in 1811 from jurisdiction of england and she discovered plesiosaur and pteranodon from this so it's very important that the first fossil was discovered by women paleontologist there now this here my talk start i am going to speak about all about dinosaurs in india uh now we are basically for the students uh, when i speak about the dinosaur it's very important uh, for me to tell you and highlight where the dinosaur age comes you as you can see the earth originated in around 1500 million years until today and then uh, you you can see the different ages of uh, single bulk cells and then multicellular cells and then age of the invertebrates age of the fishes amphibians reptiles and mammals etc but more important as far as the uh, reptiles uh, because dinosaurs were reptiles the entire thing from uh, periozoic to mesozoic they are very important here here i have tried to show you this entire from 650 million years to almost uh, 60 65 66 million years and here you can uh, you can see here how the the first fish was appearing in, in uh, uh, ordovician time and devonian and then the first reptile amphibians it is coming here and then you are the first reptiles and then uh, you are the reptilian diversity and then you have major extinction and then first dinosaurs appearing here in the triassic in the upper lower upper triassic here and then it continues that time also some mammals appeared and then diversity during this mesozoic period from triassic onwards it went on increasing then uh, uh, you can see jurassic also we had appeared in some some birds and then some primates also that appeared and then by the time we reached to the end of this mesozoic or end of the cretaceous the dinosaur became extinct so it is right from here triassic to uh, uh, this uh, upper most part of terminal cretaceous that dinosaurs ruled over here almost for over 150 million years and here i am trying to show you they these are the major extinction events because these extinction events are very common now this slide particular i am trying to show you because all the reptiles including the dinosaurs it's very important for them to be there in the paleozoic era as well as the mesozoic era now the paleozoic era ended with a mass extinction that disappeared that resulted in wiping out almost 70% of the life on the earth in do took with the inset of the triassic world about 10 million years to re recover from this catastrophe and by that time the surviving reptiles were evolving to new forms so after the extinction at the paleozoic end the triassic period is very important for us as far as the reptiles are concerned and for that matter the dinosaurs concern now during the triassic period it they included the theropods the mammals like reptiles that gives rise to the tree mammals and also we have some marine reptiles like protozoa the istiosaur we have pterosaurs and appearing sometimes around 230 million years ago 
and of course we are the earliest dinosaur that came over here and you know, for the benefit of the student just i am trying to show them because it is important for them to know because dinosaurs because sometimes when we are interacting with the student the student they are all the time they really don't know whether the dinosaurs they are where the reptiles sometimes someone call them birds or reptiles like that so dinosaurs they are the reptiles there are major four groups of reptiles what we call it anopsid because this is a orbit that is a eye socket and then we have a fenista another vicolutis over so we do not get any fenista after that there is a single uh, orbit here and they have a, which we call it anopsid like that turtles here you can see eurypsid they have one fenista here just uh, behind the orbit and in between this compa and the fenista then you have a synopsid there you get another fenista uh, uh, but that is placed ventrally and then you have from uh, uh, what we call it diapsid two fenister orbit so all or most of the uh, the reptiles including the dinosaurs they come into diapsids including our crocodiles and things now it is identified anopsis as arcosian diapsid reptiles you can see here these are diapsid reptiles these are the arcosaurs then various comes there are the crocodiles and then we have a pterosaurs and we have a dinosaurs over here now there is a basic difference because lizards are they are also reptiles so there is a basic difference between the, uh, the postures of these dinosaurs and lizards all the dinosaurs will they will have the upright postures that means all the four limbs they will be just below the body straight but as when you go to the lizard they will have a crawling posture so this is a basic difference between the lizards and the dinosaur as far as the posture is concerned of course other than the skulls and other things now then this is for the student when we see vertebrates or any animals or reptiles or mammals when they die so right from their death they get decayed at in course of their decay and many of them they get scavenged so all the time we do not get the entire skeleton some of these scavengers they will remove the tails or the limbs and sometimes the skull so it's very difficult to get the entire skeleton sometimes even if you get 60 to 70% that is a big recovery all of so from from death of the animal to to decay you can see here and then dead burial and then you ultimately get the uh, uh, mineralization there but in course of this fossil uh, fossilization right from death to the mineralization what we call is the tephomonical process uh, we lose a lot of information which are not always available to paleontologist now dinosaurs basically they are classified as ornithischian dinosaurs wherein you can see the pubis bion is directed backwards so these are ornithischian so like tyrannosaurus and nodos are ankylosaurus like that so they are ornithischian dinosaurs and they they are saurischian so they are the two major class of dinosaur ornithischian and saurischian so they are uh, uh, ornithischian dinosaurs they have a uh, pubis bone directing backward but in case saurischian that include both sauropods quadrupedal horopods predator theropods they have a lizard like hips with the pubic bone directing forward so this is basically difference here you can also see pubis bone up to this is the anterior so this is the basic difference uh, between the two ornithischia and dinosaurs now uh, why when we talk about the dinosaur they are based upon the dinosaur fossils when we say dinosaur fossil what are the dinosaur fossils they are represented by skeletons they are by their eggs nests and nesting sites their footprints and trackways and their dung mass coprolites or co so these are all the four types of fossils which are uh, we tell a lot of story for the story to us about this dinosaur and all our interpretation and our studies will be based on this fossil fossil remains now why i am going to tell you because this should be interesting what is dinosaur discovery in india in countries to discoveries in the world you see in 1824 it was william buckland who described a uh, megalosaurus from the uh, uh, the jurassic of southern england and they, he identified this a giant lizard then you can see this i i can uh, but here you can see 
we they, he was not able to uh, say anything about the dinosaur because till 1824 no one knew about the dinosaur that word came out but these were the first fossils which later on proved to be dinosaurs uh, a pegalosaurs uh, that were discovered in 1824 by william buckland it was only in the year uh, 1842 when the richard owen he coined the word dinosauria and then he included Uh, 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 many of these uh, other megalosaurs he got down with him uh, uh, with helicosaurus and he got on with dinosaurus so that was the first dinosaurs which came into existence i mean the word in 1824 now coming to india now only 4 years after the first dinosaur megalosaur was described by buckland in 1824 This was the first discovery of India came in 1828. That had only four years after the first dinosaurs were discovered in the world, and this was 14 years before the word dinosaur was coined in 1842 by Richard Owen. He is a William Sliman who discovered the first dinosaur bone from the limit of formation of Jabalpur. He was a British officer, and then after after since 1828 to 1877. this particular fossil bone which you are able to see it here this was a caudal vertebra of a dinosaur no one will really able to identify in the twin two series of the fall from the cord plain but ultimately in the year 1870 they were richard lidecker he described it is as a dinosaur and established the first dinosaur that he designated as a titanosaur indicus so this was the first dinosaur described from india to a species level but unfortunately even this titanosaurus species now it is not valid species it was only this is what this was all in uh, before the pre uh, i mean in the pre independence now it was only in uh, pre independence from 1907 1919 and between 1930 33 here you can see 32 and 33 it was charles metley who came from british museum naturalist in london and he visited he was sponsored by uh, uh, persil slaventus and he did two expeditions as i said 1917 uh, 19 and then one at 1932 most of his excursion they were at jabalpur and kuzdura sections and he collected a lot of dinosaur bones and it is the classic volume which is produced that came as a paleontologic india ka by geological survey of india that is by one hun and matley in 1933 so most of our indian knowledge on the dinosaurs way back in what was generated in pre independence it is based on the charles matlis expedition collection preparation and description but majority of the collection whatever as uh, matley has collected they were shipped to to the british museum and uh, bundy and of course some of them they went to even american museum naturalistic by burnham brown and most of these specimens part of them they were repatriated back to india which is there in the indian museum now and then uh, uh, many of the collection it still exists in the british museum now here i am just trying to show you because uh, you may be because these are two expedition 1719 when he came and uh, bala shimla uh, he did a uh, uh, jabalpur it is a classic map by matley you can see it. it's this map is on 8 is to a 1 mile how okay, what a classic map we had produced you see uh, and then on 32 33 most of his expedition were there in chota shimla you can see the section here all the limit of formation is here it is sitting over the your uh, jabalpur clays and then uh, in the lamita you start the green sand store the lower uh, limestone and the mortal nodular bed and then the upper limestone and then you get the upper side and then you are the deccan trap and you can see these red lines here these are the three levels where we have dinosaurs a three levels stratigraphic level within that confined to the lower part and all these expeditions and collection of bones basically comes from from this section but these collections they are most of the collection is there in the british of course some of these things are but most of these collection in uh, 2006 uh, gsi uh, uh, had taken up the project as a museum research and we went to many of the museums to search for this uh, collection of the pre independence collection of dinosaurs in india and it was surprising for us to see in the indian museum 
there was a large collection of metli which was not even opened up they leave apart their description it and it teach those labels were still in the writing of the uh, uh, metli and even they were wrapped in the cotton that was rotting up but we i along with uh, jeff filson we tried to open up and it was a big catch for us which we tried to study and we gave a many news description for that this is metlis you can see when he visited 1917 1932 33 you can see uh, because when uh, the british museum they were able to provide me or uh, give give me access to their archives and i was able to get some of their uh, original sites uh, from where the uh, uh, metli he carried out his excavation because you know he did excavation in bala chimla or chota chimla but we really don't know from which horizon from which mythology from which place he has collected the bones over there but then you can see that is the photograph uh, by charles metley at the time of excavation and then uh, when we took up the project uh, gs sponsored by uh, as per the fsp then we were in search of these original sites from where this excavation were carried out and fortunately it was in 2008 we were able to see the original location of this matlis where still we were able to see the many debris and the bone there in the chota shimla hill from where this bones and this we found in 2008 along with my friend uh, uh, jeffrey wilson and also we have a major vijay mughal from geological survey fund it was a book so we really knew it from where and these are the very articulated limbs which you are getting these limbs are there in the british museum uh, london and uh, they sent us some plaster cast which we are able to see from the which are right now there in the uh, ajab bangla or central museum at nagpur now coming to this i am trying to show you the indian dinosaur fossil locality as i told you right from the first dinosaur which was collected in 1820 28 the first dinosaur bone it took quite a life it was in the 1981 almost after over 150 years that the dinosaurs eggs were found in india almost after 150 years by the officers uh, of, of geological survey of india and you can see and then what happened here i am trying to show you a map where you can see all the dinosaur bearing localities that shows the those show the skeletons as well as the uh, um, your eggs and these things like you can see this is the really famous balaseno khada uh, khida area here you can, you can see here and then the, the entire we have some uh, of course these are from all from the limita because most of the indian late cretaceous dinosaurs they come from the limita sediment which they are deposited in different basins there are a very few localities in tetrapia like uh, dayapar and corbet uh, uh, and then um, 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 anjar and ranipur where we get the intertapia fossils here you you can see a right from rayoli to uh, jabo or bag area this complete dinosaur bones through doha de land it continues almost a belt of over 200 mil which is full of dinosaur uh, dinosaur uh, uh, bones and eggs but unfortunately we get dinosaur skeletal remains and bones uh, what we i call it a hatcheries and the graveyards of dinosaur with abundant theropods and dinosaurs only in the rayoli balasan area the moment you move to the west Uh, the dhar area you get only dinosaur nest site there you hardly find any dinosaur bones there but the are in old area all over there the sediments their deposits it's of 13 hour mystic year then as you go towards the jabalpur the day you get the is another very important locality But here we get the again get theropod sauropod like indosaurus and all and then we got they met sagar also but then they are comparatively younger to what they get in the your rayoli and dhar area because they are from mastic tian 29 ah because light limit of sediments are time to see the deposit and then you another basin what we call it near nagpur we have nd basin you, you can see it here pisdura and the chandrapur uh, area where we get a lot of uh, dinosaur bones eggs there boat it uh, uh, dongara and of course it is the area and this green one you are seeing is they they are the older gonwana locality sorry this kalamedu is cretaceous by mistake it has come but then arialur of course it's a, a cretaceous 
But all these gains, they are all Pranita Godavari, where all over dinosaur comes. A geological survey of India, especially P.K. Yadagiri Sahab, and uh, this Indian Statistical Institute, they were deeply involved in excavating this dinosaur bones from here, from Pranita Godavari, that claimed from the Jurassic sediments from here. Now, as uh, well, students, well, you know, well, because well, as I tell you, we have the dinosaurs which are coming from the uh, Gondwana sediments, that is uh, from Bright Tessic to Jurassic, and then, then we have late Cretaceous. So, as we move from 210 to 150, Jurassic to 75 years, there were different paleogeography that India is such witness, becoming a part of Pangaea to Gondwana. Uh, that uh, fragmented and then to Cretaceous when India started uh, migrating as an isolated uh, plate towards the uh, Eurasia and ultimate colliding with the Eurasian plate sometimes in people. So it's a separate journey uh, uh, right from separation in 90 million years to uh, 55 million years when India developed their own endemic dinosaur fauna. But what is interesting that whatever dinosaur fossils we get, anywhere in whether it's a, uh, Africa or it's a South America, or North America, Europe, we get all the dinosaurs which are related. They are linked because they were there was no hindrance as far as the uh, dispersal of these animals and plants were there because it was a one continental mass. And as this uh, fragmentation go on, they each continents and uh, different uh, plate they, they started developing their own uh, fauna and flora. So that's why Indian late Cretaceous uh, fauna it has their own endemism very close to the Madagascar because we referred our current with the Madagascar up to 88 million years. And then if you go to the Gunana times, even in that we are very similar to what we get in the. Uh, South America, especially the Argentina and uh, 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 Brazils. Now, it is very important uh, for us to show because uh, I am taking you about the dinosaur. We should know what is the story of our dinosaurs as far as the Indian strategic of is concerned. You can see here, as I told you, the oldest dinosaur reported here by Shankar Chetiji, Vakelia, Malarensis is from the uh, from the uh, uh, Pranita Godavari, the Trisic formation, upper Trisic formation. formation. Then we have yeah. Kutasaurus, and then from the Jurassic sediment, and also from Jurassic of Kutch here. Then you 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 see there is a big gap here. After uh, what you are getting in uh, Kelvin uh, in the Jurassic sediment, we have a big gap. You are not really able to get any anything over here. And we really don't know what is happening because it's a 60 million years gap. So we don't know what happened to the dinosaurs, how they look like and how they were really living, what were their habitat. Then what we get the glimpses of dinosaurs only in the Albin Epstein times, for, for the, where we get them from the Nimal sandstone or Imat Nagar sandstone. And then again, we have a big gap here, almost for 35 million years. You see, because then we start getting them only in the uppermost Cretaceous part over here. So there is a big gap, though there is there is not a continuity as far as the history of dinosaurs. The base knowledge comes from the Gondwana dinosaur and then from late Cretaceous dinosaur. In most of our late Cretaceous dinosaurs, they are deeply associated with Deccan volcanic eruption because these Limita sediment and the intertrepian sediment, they are integral part of the Deccan volcanic sequences. Now here you see Gondwana and I am trying to show you here. These are the two uh, fossils I am showing you here. Here you see I am trying to sh uh, show you this uh, Barapasaurus which is there in Indian Statistical Museum which was the uh, work of uh, S.H. Jain Saab, uh, Shankar Chatterjee Saab, Chatterjee Saab, Chatterjee Saab family. And it is the only uh, based fossil described from the Gondwana which is articulated and of course it was also hardly 40% with many missing and even the skull is missing, it is a volcanodont skull uh, from South, South Africa. Africa. But it is uh, almost a reconstructed and articulated skeleton. And it gives fairly good idea how were Gondwana dinosaurs. They really looked like 150 million years back. So it is there in a, and this is of course, a, you can see the GSI map all along the Pronata Godavari. A very classic work where our people from GSI, they did a lot of very meticulous mapping and 
then uh, we were able to show really the localities the we sometimes to show this yaman palli and then this sirocha uh, um, from where these two dinosaurs came and this is a late contribution by pk yadgiri uh, who uh, constructed this kota saroch and he tried to reconstruct and mount this skeleton in the billa science museum in hyderabad so it is there so these are the till date these are the only two mounted skeletons from gunwana one is in uh, isa museum and other is in bala simla by geological survey of india and these two is constructed from twin this uh, you can see these query maps or pit maps of excavation where the yadgiri sub did it and this particular skeleton it was reconstructed from bones of 12 individuals they are of the same age and this is of course uh, this is more than 70% of the skeleton and of course other are some other other things and then coming to to the, the major limita locosity when we come from gonwana to 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 the late cretaceous they are the three best producing uh, uh, limita sediments one is of course uh, it was the jawalpur which i showed you here limita sediments and then you, uh, we have another uh, old reports of a uh, non dongarga basin whether we get pisdura and dongarka described in pre independence and then this is the very latest discovery by geological survey of india are uh, from 1981 to 82 you can see uh, the improvement this may be around 40 kilometers long and there uh, you can see the number of sites which you are getting here the sediment they are erinaceous sediment they are uh, uh, that is approximately uh, mostly the um, um, you are ore bank and uh, channel related chilled uh, species and these sediments in these as i told you they are deposits uh, mastectin c30 normal to 229 r then here some of the bones which are i am trying to show because the students specifically they were meant when we collect the bones we collect the bones uh, bones like the from the excavations you see sometimes we get isolated sometimes they are semi articulated and articulated it's not always that it is we get the entire skeleton or even partial skeleton or for that matter even it is difficult to get semi articulated scale or even half a tail of any dinosaur which are these are the fossils which we get on excavation but unfortunately these two these fossils are there in the from the american museum of natural history that is removed by burnham brown Uh, of course we are trying our best to say that if we do not able to uh, get those original fossils at least we will have a plaster cast or replica of these uh, these fossils now these are the some of the from uh, uh, bala shimla only these are the best this dinosaurs which were earlier identified as entactosaurus so you can see these all these original fossil bones they are in the british museum natural history i i was able to get some uh, 3d printings um, uh, files from this uh, um, british museum natural history and then we know but they unfortunately excepting some plaster casts and some bones there in the gsi curatorial division we do not have so this is one of the dinosaurs septentrionis um, is of course not a titanosaurus genus but this is a titanosaurus from pomedanus and it looks something uh, like this you can see it. so all our dinosaurs the description are based on the isolated bones like this now this is another described by minus statistics especially by sl jain and uh, saswati bandopadhyay and then it got rediscovered and revised by wilson also it was earlier described as a um, uh, titanosaurus colbarti uh, then of course uh, it was described as a isa colbarti because titanosaurus genus was considered as invalid and J J wilson he described this as sai kolbarte this is the dongarka in vidarbha pisdura it's a very wonderful sites where you you can get this is a query my the area of the bones when we excavate you are getting some of these bones we are getting and based on these bones only you can just imagine the position of the carcass which was buried over there but based on because it's not even uh, I, i will put it less than 15% but still we try to reconstruct and how the animal must have looked like and it is that this dongarga locality is very important it because this specially non dongarga basin and pisdura and dongarga especially by vidarbha because it's not only really the dinosaurs we have big snakes there we have turtles fossils we have crocodile fossils so we have all sorts of reptiles over there of course other than the classic fishes in the limita sediment 
and this is after the discovery in 1981 by geological survey of india when mohan and my colleague of the gsi we made a discovery here i showed you this and then uh, we discovered it from rayoli over here and then subsequently because gsi put me on that uh, fossil hunting and uh, i asked me to uh, extend the search i was all along this this entire bed of uh, 70 kilometers i was able to locate many of the dinosaur nest sites and of course including few skeletal sites that is how the lamita sediments they look like here which are dinosaur bearing and then you have the bones embedded in like that and you have also the dinosaur nest in this bones at rayoli itself and some of these eggs you can see these are the first eggs this were discovered in 1981 from the balasino query which was the sec query because they were uh, mining it for the cement it was a calcitite sandstone but it was very rich in carbonate so uh, through they were using it in the sevalia plant for they were and in, in it course that we were able to encounter this fossils over there when gsi because it rival it is very important for us because i am trying to we show you the section over it's a it's a particular place they may be 6 to 7 meters but especially in the ossiferous bed i was able to get this 5 meters thick vector which is um, um, resting over the godra granites or sometimes the your lunawada uh, or aravalli group of rocks here you can see here right from conglomerates to then it goes to the uh, pebbly sandstone and the limestone here you are getting dinosaur uh, uh, bones here full full of that at, the, at this at this level and then your dinosaur nest here and then some nest and actual fragment so this is very classic and this um, this almost and uh, they uh, almost 700 to 600 to 700 meter long because when they prepared a species uh, map locating from the dinosaur ossiferous so you can see all these dinosaur bones all along that here it is it is how it is spreading over here all along that and then we have dinosaur nest sites over and it is gsi these are the queries so we only uh, excavated a very small part of that and then it is ultimately isi also did some query over there so all these bones are there and now under the face the when uh, the uh, government of gujarat uh, tcgl uh, department forest we are trying to develop this park and then we want to excavate some of these uh, bones because there are no bones right now because all the bones removed to by geological survey of india and then whatever excavated by indian state security they are removed to the to the isi calcutta so we are trying our best to some of the uh, collection which has not studied that can be repatriated back to rayoli museum because that deserves to be to be to be there now here again i am trying to show you how these dinosaur bones are there and then down we these are the query how the bones are lying and then in the out top because this is one of the cervical vertebra they are there and then uh, we can say this vitreous chicken we we are doing some of the outcrops over over there so that is basically how the outcrop in the limiter looks like and then we did the excavation my pelish suresh chavasta from geological survey of india when after the discovery paleontology division gsi western region they did a lot of querying there almost 8 to 9 puts open 400 bones removed this is some of the queries you can see the map query prepared and then some of the bones this black one you are seeing they are predator theropod bones these bones were taken to the university of michigan because it was not possible for us to prepare this these bones from this from this that's why under some collaboratively these bones were removed to to uh, not to michigan sorry to university of chicago where they were prepared because i was uh, fortunately there uh, in the um pp also chicago and then also so see then you see what we call as a rajasaurus these 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 are the only bones these bones are not there from if i remember 2161 1 to 33 bones which is currently there because now they have become the type specimen after discovering 2003 by uh, by wilson through shivas and other these are the only bones which are there and then based on that only we are trying to say this the even our skull is not complete this skulls are only you get some brain cells even we do not have a dentary or maxilla like that So we really don't know. We know this is the base deep sea Raja Saros, but then really don't know how it looked looked like. Here also another Rayoli Saros. This is another theropod. 
it is from the querying done by indian statistical institute again it is based on that i as i indian statistical india they also did excavation there were only two field sections but a uh, lot many bones were uh, removed very hurriedly and they described rayoli saros by shankar chatterjee and this is nova setal who described this on to is a rayoli saros so there are two uh, theropods currently which are described from the from the rayoli sites the, and then this is the very recent find of a small theropod uh, that is this comes from the pisdora where we are able to get a very small um, uh, lower jaw from this and that we are trying to of course we have just submitted a manuscript Uh, uh, there in the journal vertebrate paleontology so we have one uh, specimen levisicus from jabalpur a very small um, theropod maybe of the uh, small size of a, a goat there and then one is from jabalpur and then this we are getting from pisdora and now uh, this is just to show you uh, if you are consider the uh, late cretaceous sediment these are the only the dinosaurs species which are considered or recognized as a valid species whatever described earlier they are considered other nomandubia or they are invalid so along the dinosaur we have only isosaurus gymnosaurus and there are theropods we have only indosaurus rupturus indosaurus meti rajasaurus nomadensis rhyocelus and then we have levisicus from jabalpur and nova saurus so these are till date only the G valid accepted species of indian dinosaur there are many others which we are trying to work out working on their taxonomy and many of the things because we were uh, try, trying to excavate bones jab done by gsi so it has it very challenging when we this, this is because in the royal museum for the benefit of the student how gsi carries out their excavation right from beginning till they do preparation and then finally remove the bones Uh, from the matrix and the, from the rocks and plastering and then finally packing it taking it to the to the laboratories for the studies here so this was all through murals and sculptures we have tried to you know, tried to um, um, demonstrate and, and display in the rayoli film museum we see one of the classic museum in the rayoli museum because whatever excavation we are calling these bones are to be prepared there only because if the go is where it is very difficult so we were prepared the bones some of these bones then will be in the museum and some of them may be displayed in the site itself where the where people the visitors they can see the tree area of bones so we have the complete preparation lab which provision which we have done and it is there in the already there in the rayoli museum there and this is the we look because whatever other museums you see we have only the those cartoon models of life size models of dinosaur here we first time because uh, by or other we insisted that we should have a skeletal model because they are really good for research purpose because we really know how many caudal vertebra how many dorsal vertebra sacral vertebra how the skull looks like what you know and there are two based on the indian and how the dinosaur bones are occurring here so these are some of the things we, we which are displayed there in the rayoli museum and it is they very much there for the student to take benefit of that and it is good that we are making presentation on the ifd uh, celebration day where students will be benefited and I only request the keeping staff whenever they are planning the long tours they must take them to such museum which are really there for the educative and entertainment purpose for students researchers there and then after once we do it the skeletal models then we try to put the uh, make the real life size model on that actually size because once the reconstruction it's there we put muscles then you try to put the scale and then we try to put how the animals really look like this is a raja saurus this skulls based on that we try to to there it is also important when we reconstruct it the pulsar becomes very important whether how he was this fellow was running how the tail was there whether he, he was resting it on the ground or it was like that so there are many challenges and there is a much actually is biology is geologists there all involved into that but this is the this is the animotrix it really um, it makes all sorts of effective moments it runs there and then in mix and oh yes this is the first animotrix model which is there in in the rayoli museum there in gujarat it's a, it's a wonderful thing now after the skeleton i will just like to take you to the dinosaur eggs and milk because it it's very important for us. as i told you the first dinosaur bones that the go it was found in um 1828 but we got 
it uh, the first x only in the year uh, uh, in 1981 so these are the first that which i was telling you and this is the rayul area and those things i was telling you which is full of dinosaur yes and if you look at the map geological survey of india that we tried to prepare entire gujarat if you see all along this uh, uh, this this kheda area this is the belt kheda belt how many beautiful those sites are there and then in between the this area up to the bag to the adjoining we have also those jhalo dohad area which is again uh, full of these dinosaurs nests and that and then of course this is a skeletal model so you get dozens of nest sites and you get thousands of eggs over there without diversity and this site is very important unique in the same that in a single locality it 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 uh, rayoli it a single locality it in rayoli you 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 are able to see a graveyard abundant skeletal remains of two major group theropods and sauropods abelisaurid and titanid sauropods together with associated and then you are also their hatcheries both of theropods and sauropod together in a single locality with a single instance in the world that's why this rayoli agent say very important significant and that's why we have a most state of art uh, dinosaur field museum i am telling you field museum do there is no such museum anywhere in india and then okay. and then we have a that is attached to a dinosaur fossil site or uh, what we calling it a dinosaur uh, rayoli dinosaur uh, uh, fossil uh, park that that was discovered by gs so it this museum it attached to that and this is the uh, first dinosaur i am saying this is was the acc query now of course it is abandoned totally ruined it is taken away these are some of the ruins because i visited that area and uh, i think 2004 everything was gone there and these are some of the ruins which are there and then of uh, course dsc gs has jib there and then these are the eggs which i am telling you these are the first eggs they were removed from here and then we had nests also from there in mind i say in nest sites nest sites that may be anything that can be 30 meters by 20 meter sites and all these nest sites they are confined to one time plane okay they may be occurring say maybe 110 to 110 km msl but you will see within that 20 meters or 30 meters block what you will get a number of this nest here this small which i am trying to to show you here number of nest they may be uh, 13 nest 14 nest in one single site and within the individual nest you get the disposition of eggs how they occur in individual nest this is very important for us because these eggs in the nest they occur the as they were late 67 million years back so they give us a lot of clues about the habitat the community behavior the nesting behavior of these dinosaurs and that's why gsi they specifically impact on on the fill occurrences and we studied both the fill occurrences and living we did not remove many of this it those still many of this uh, nest they are there we could remove only some very few both the uh, eggs form uh, for our morphological and structural study and then uh, you see this uh, how they are distributed in individual site and you will see when we study these eggs in the single site uh, and not only in the um, single nest but in in the individual nesting sites all the eggs belong to the same morphotypes that showed that it was laid by a single type of dinosaur a single and then you are getting a, a number of nests so that shows that the dinosaurs they were laying nests in the in the community or in the groups you see how this uh, eggs they they occur like that it's a single you can see here that this may be around 10 or 12 cm and you are see this uh, these eggs around around here one egg here one egg here so we all plot this eggs and then we also try to make a reconstruction sometimes you may get a smaller diameter because it is oh, the bathing plate that has cut them along different levels so it's a because they are all spherical football size uh, spherical eggs laid by the sauropod because they are essentially spherical so this this provides us a very clue to clue to these are all calcitites sand stones here you can again see how this i will not be able to show you many nests because some time constraint then you can see how how they beautifully they occur and these those spherical eggs there of sauropods herbivores titanosaurus sauropod but then also we have a nest of 
theropod dinosaurs here. You can see, you can see here. And it was for the first time when we found it at Lyori, uh, Lavarium there at Lyori. It, 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 it was not a nice isolated nest. We found a complete nest site where I was able to see at least, uh, I think, around 11 nests were there. And at least uh, 84, 85 weeks were there. So I was able to see that even the theropod that time, they nested in colonies. And it was believed all over the world till that time that dinos these theropod dinosaurs, they never lived in groups. They were... No, even the Ibilisaurus theropods, 67 million years back, in late Cretaceous times, with elongated eggs, they were laying eggs in colonies. That means they were also living in groups. They may be a pack of hunters. And then you can see how the eggs are there, spherical to this collapse. So this is a, this is a wonderful discovery. And then you can see this is from the area, Rayoli, you can see. You can see here this one, two, three, four eggs you, you can see here. Over there you can see here. You and then if you look at that, we are trying to then you see how how you get it. And you could try to remove you, you get the eggs like that. So that is how on the basic outcomes you know. But even the eggs, they may be even if you get a lot of eggshells scattered that but you will never miss the eggshells. And then you look that that is how you can you are able to see the eggshells. That is the outline of the spherical's eggs you are seeing. This is of course on the scale. And if you if you look at that. This particular fellow and ornamentation that will show you like this. So they are all having a typical microstructure, different types of things. Then after the nest, we try to make the 3D reconstruction of that because we 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 are getting the nest like that, X next like that, this nest like that. But how they were laid? We know that the nest 70 million and back laid like that when this dino, this uh, sauropod they buried their eggs in the river sand community. So when we try to reconstruct the next because they wonderful work by Willows et al. 2010 and they did in France and then we did it in India. You can see here. You can see when the female dinosaur she is trying to lay their eggs in the soft sand of the river. Because all the eggs in India, you go to any side, whether in Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, or Gujarat, they are essentially in the sandstone. They are essentially in the Calcutta sandstone. They will never lay their eggs in the clays because that will clog the pores of the eggs. Then you can see this particular uh, uh, fellow, this female dinosaur, she is trying to dig a hole by there because they will always deal. Because the contemporary, you see the lizards and even the turtles, they try to dig their nest in the sand with their hind limbs. And after the hind limbs, they, you see how this, uh, uh, um, this buried, uh, this, sorry, this nest, when they dig, how they look like. And then they, you see this. And it is because of the impression of that a pace over here, which is there. So this will be the ish shape of the nest where it has not yet laid the eggs. It will like that. And when then finally she lays the egg, it will be here. And then the eggs will be disposed like 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 this. Here. You, you can so that tells you a, a, a lot about their nesting there, where they nested in colours and then so uh, the sand of the rivers. So from India, and also I am telling you, GSI has also provided a lot of work because earlier, even in the America, they also said that the dinosaurs, they were building up their mound-like structures with the use of vegetation. We got thousands of snakes and numbers of those and nest sites in Gujarat and subsequently in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. But none of, nowhere we could get any mound-building structure for the sauropod. And no vegetable signs or plants remains in the nest. So essentially, they buried their eggs and they covered it with the uh, digged out sand. And it was through the solar energy only that eggs were incubated. So that was the first evidence which was given by India. And then, of course, subsequently, the France and Exembourg by province in Spain, they also came out with the same thing. So many fundamental contributions made by the Geological Survey of India. Here you see, uh, unlike Gobi Desert in uh, China and uh, Great Cretaceous, you, you see... Uh, they have got wonderful because we are getting in um, all our uh, deposits in the um, uh, ch channel deposits are really well, where they will subject it. Here, whatever most of the dinosaurs, as you go in Gobi Desert, uh, that means where China, Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, which are full of dinosaurs. 
they are mostly the lewis sediment they are wind sediment and the no sooner the animal dies they are immediately covered with the with the lewis or the wind blown sand so there is not much chance of some transportation or scavenging and that's why they get the best preserved fossils and abundant fossils in this china here you can see uh, one these are the eggs which you are seeing over here and then you are getting the impression of a different claim you see in entire thailand and then based on that we can reconstruct how this animal particular over after it it was dealing and then of course based on that we are just trying to reconstruct how this animals came out dinosaurs once the eggs are laid out and the dinosaurs babies come out and maybe some of them predated by dinosaur they will just venture out from that so this was all about so if you try to derive some interpretation on that nest always occurs in the sandstones and eggs laid in saucer shaped depression in single layer presence of no vegetation material in the nest no no specific pattern of say in nest a majority of the nests have eggs disposed in a haphazard manner so they were not really uh, trying to arrange their eggs or manipulating them this was a saucer shaped egg and they just uh, uh, eggs laid like that and you should know because you know reptiles reptiles lay their eggs in one oval position only it's not that they lay one egg and the next day they eat another like hens or other birds because the reptiles the system is entirely different so entire they may be related 14 eggs but they will lay it at a one time only all the reptiles even the snake you they may be laying 30 eggs 40 eggs but it is a one instance they will go on laying the eggs at a time so no specific patterns of eggs majority of the nest have eggs disposed in a haphazard manner evidence suggests community nesting by titanos who buried eggs in the soft sand and indeed evidence suggests that theropods have been sorry also nested in colonies and as in packs followed the sauropod for then codicil that comes and then of course the skeletals and the eggs and then this is very important because nowhere in the this in india again provided a unique evidence of coprolite that is a dung mass we really do really don't know what dinosaurs were eating because lot time say if you go to any of the terrestrial section cretaceous or jurassic there are lot of plants the vegetation community and forests which are shown late cretaceous forest but these dinosaurs like mammals today they will not eat everything they they like they will have a preferred plants only and how you will make that that particular dinosaur meeting this evidence it came first time from the indian coprolite these coprolites were discovered long back in 1929 by edikas maybe others but then that time they were not able to see any plant tissue inside that it was only in the 2000 while working uh, in the this nandunga ka bhi in chandrapur district maharashtra i was able to get big cause of this uh, this uh, plant bearing this coprolites over here now you can see like a, a long sort of pot it may be uh, some 8 meters 9 meter long from uh, snout to tail and how long a distance has to travel because they had a very weak nutrition and it has to be carried over carried over carried over to the cat it will be lay there and finally it will be food so this fermentation if not much it will be there inside the guts so it tells you a lot many things about the habit this is the pisdwar area which is i am trying to many of the student from department of geology uh, dr samant and for uh, colleagues he had been taking them to these uh, sites over there this is a very wonderful site where you get the gonana sediments then you get limitas and then you get deccan traps and then you get the red clays and some associate sandstone where you get different types of coprolites a b b a c and titanosaurs ke coprolites which we assign that is only a big coprolite it is here in the field every time the form of the tail the catch of the dinosaur bones sex turtles crocodiles they come together it it's a paradise for the vertebrate paleontologist provided you are able to go just before the monsoon and just after the end of the summer when they farmers they start tilling their field now these are some of the um, uh, coprolite which are i am trying to these are the coprolite you can see beautiful coprolite which are all segmented inside you see 
And these are different types. These are sauropod, these are type A, type B, sub -A. They are different. It's not only all the coprolites or dung mass of dinosaurs, they are also of some turtles also. And when we cut this section, polished sections we did in GSI uh, laboratory, you see all the comminuted plant tissues inside that. And what we get inside, these are the plant tissues which you get inside the dung mass. So actually you know what this particular paper hello had really eating and what it was eating. What we get? Permanentalized plant tissue of pteridophytes and angiosperm. And some people in the mouth, this worked out my colleague Bible after. Someone she has been working a lot and was my other colleague Heman Son to say he also worked with us. So these are the plant tissues. And they always so you, you can see here. So we can make out, these are the actually copolite, this may be around 7 centimeters and then you see the plant tissue and we see them under the microscope, the uh, diamond polish sections, we get, get things like that. So really, you can see here, they are all soft tissues, no here you are getting any hard plant tissue. So that was the preferred diet for the sauropods herbivores. Now you see that time, there were many contemporary plants that existed that time. You can see Flowers, fruit, seeds over here. Some of this that we get in the coprolite. This is very extensively worked out by one of our collaborators, uh, especially Stephen Manchester, um, um, uh, Gates Valley, Florida University, where uh, we have been working together. Dr. Samant is there. And then we were able to see many of these uh, um, fossil fruits, seeds, flowers there. You, know, you, can, you can see these are the grape fruits, what we call it a white orchid. So that time, 67 million years back, the grapes it originated in India. That's why where our colleague, Dr. Saman, she is working. So they, there is a wonderful, uh, because there will always be animal-plant interaction. So what type of plants existed during dinosaur time and how they were interacting th that time? Because we, the plant also providing a lot of uh, uh, information on the climates and the paleoecology and the temperature. So collectively, we are also trying to study the contemporary. Now coming to the, actually, what I am telling you is the comminuted plant tissue. And they are very coarse plant tissues because they are dentition, what you are saying. These are from the rhyolis. All these uh, specimens are there currently in the uh, rhyolis. You can see the teeth, how slender and weak teeth they, they are. You can see how they are they in the upper jaw and the lower jaw. So unlike mammals, they will not able to bunch uh, their uh, uh, food or grind their food. It will be very coarse sitting, you see here. What you can see. So they have got a very slender seed. So Indian sauropod sauropods prefer to crop soft tissues like tender leaf shoots, influences, flowers and fruits of selected higher plants like angiosperms, pteridophytes as their main diet. No hard rooty tissue repeating their jam acres. And interestingly, we are also able to get some cytolis, uh, 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 where we are able to say that even in the coprolites, because we were working uh, with Dr. Mm -hmm. Vandana Prasad mm -hmm. from BSIP, and um, Stumbar Carolian from Washington University, Dr. Vandana Saman from Upper University, and we, we and we were able to say that even that time, 67 million years back, the rice, the Uraiji family, it was there. Whether dinosaurs, they were eating it or it was ingested with the data, but then it originated in the in the late Kita 67 million years back. And if you go by molecular dating, we go back to 120 million years. So rights originated that time in the India, and that is the Indian subcontinent. I am telling Indian subcontinent because Pakistan was also a part of that. So whatever we are getting in Pakistan, whether it's a Baluchistan or it's in. Their dinosaurs and our dinosaurs are very, very similar. So you can say based on that, we are trying to scale you. Now the next coming to that, these are track makers and walking. I told you that because they are footprint. We, we considered skeletals, we considered uh, eggs, we considered uh, 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 dung mass, and these are the tracks. Unfortunately, we do not have a very... Uh, now, I mean, they recognized the uh, tax and takers accepting some reports from the JSML uh, Rooker Foundation. But that is how, when the dinosaurs walking, based on the, uh, the gait and postures of their uh, walking, you will be able to make out because uh, how they were walking and how they will be able to imprint their footprints on that. Because this height becomes very important. 
and then you can see uh, how this will be preserved. If animal walking on that, he will have a depression of the soft sediments, and he walks out, and then the sediments coming over there. But this I am showing because the sediment student should appreciate that, and these sediments will cover these depressions, and then as you come uh, downward, as you are seeing, and in, in in this D, ultimately you are getting only these remnants, and then again covered, and that is how we are able to get it. So they they will able to make this. Tracks and these are these are essentially your sauropod, sauropod dinosaurs, and their tracks. Now this is the dinosaur, but there is a India provides a unique evidence in the world of the predation of a dinosaur by late Cretaceous, next Cretaceous millennium. It is a unique specimen in India and unique fossil in the world. It because and it's a unique gift to the world to the contemporary Google researcher. Uh, where GSA has provided this unique specimen to the world, a unique uh, specimen snake. You can see here this snake. I'm not because only one slide I introduced. You can you can you can see here. These are all the total vertebral column. You can see here. You can see here. Here around it, all around it. It's a beautiful. This specimen also when I discovered in 1987, but it was very difficult because we do not have any advanced preparation facilities. So GSA and the government of India, Ministry of Science. After a great struggle, they permitted us to remove these specimens to uh, to Michigan, and we prepared there. And then you can see it. Obviously, you can see here. This is a small dinosaur bones, and also a egg over here. And then you see how you the complete coil of those vertebrae it will be there. And then you have a skull coming over that. And you see the it is crushed. You have a you have a coil over there, and then you have a Uh, eggs in the center of it, where get, and they, this is a poor uh, sauropod in the nest, nest of a sauropod which which is there, and this is based on this is predation of a dinosaur by late Cretaceous snake. This is almost a three point five meter long snake, Sana. Then this is a life size model because it's a three point five meter like, and very meticulously prepared, including the teeth and everything. And you can see the position what I showed you. In the center, you can see here the egg is there. Another egg is lying there. We have a hatchling here, and then then how this head is coming over here. So this was in 1987, and along with Jeff Wilson specimen, we came out with it. This is a life cycle reconstructed by Tyler Keller of uh, of Michigan. So this is and this right now it is there in the Geological Survey of of, of India, where you will be able to see the original specimens in the Paleontology Division. But the replica of that is there in the uh, museum, and also this life support measure. This is their unit. It has costed us eighteen thousand dollars, but that was given to us under the collaboration by University of Michigan, Kurtzi Jeff Wilson. And just to tell you, all these dinosaurs, because someone may have doubt how they were able to eat such a big size, even the size of a baby. They were competent, but you see how the the seniors say this is a lizard skull, and this I am trying to try to go by macro scan side. You can see this lower jaw, the skull. This is lower jaw, and then lot of teeth you can see here. Difference in the gap of lizards and the snakes. Why snakes are able to? You can see here because it's a giant over here. You can see. Here. You see. Forty-five degrees. They discovered a KTB layer. This Cretaceous tertiary boundary is defined based on the paleontology only. Even in a GSSP, if you have any uh, global stratotype section, it, these sections are defined only on paleontology and the fossil. So these are based on the marine fossils KTB, and here you are able to get abundance this uh, traces of iridium there, and many other uh, shock cords and things like that. And then they they said that it is uh, contributed by extraterrestrial impact. Lot of uh, work in the subsequent uh, marine sections in Italy, Spain, uh, Denmark, and uh, things like that. So they, it becomes a viable mechanism for extinction. And everyone said that no, because there was a extra um, bolide impact at Chicxulub, also at 67 million years back. 
66 million years back and they said that it caused a global mass extinction and that crater was supposed to be around 10 kilometer size and it has created a crater almost 600 kilometer wide because most of the ktb boundary sections in the world they are in the marine section it is only in north america when we go to williston basin or montana where you get the terrestrial sections you can see the hillcap formation because i had an opportunity gs sent me under those project i visited and visited all those sections here and then you see from hillcap formation to fortinian formation you have a ktb boundary here we have also some coal layer here and it is well defined our dinosaurs will be all disappear somewhere at those beautiful triceratops and all but this is the terrestrial section that is continuing across from mastectian below the cretaceous tertiary boundary to younger to pelvisian but that is not uh, because other and other they are there in the marine section but in india we get all these sections but we do not have continuity because we get them only in the but um, um, at multiple stratigraphic levels in the in the um, uh, deccan volcanic sequences so what uh, we did i did, we studied all the dinosaur being sections in india right from limitas as you are telling khododa jabalpur pisdura dongargao and then ranipur and takli they are interdependent section anjar is interdependent section we have uh, khira and then we have malwas and then uh, we we studied all these sections and then based we have magnetostatic opening constant we have also some ergon ergon dates we did the carlotta carbon isotopic of milankovic and based on that because earlier we did some molecular static of this sorry is in milankovic static of along with this professor uh, has jargon hansen of copenhagen and then i have got gsi a collaboration with that and then we were able to tell that the first dinosaurs in cretaceous they appeared at this level first level of appearance is c13 alpha that is 500 kilo years or 500000 years before the cretaceous tertiary boundary so they went on originating diversity flying and by the time they reach here at least 350 years before the ktb boundary all of them they become extinct so our indian dinosaurs they never reached to the cretaceous tertiary boundary over here at global impact is right over there that means our extinction of dinosaurs in india is not related to the to the chicxulub impact or bolide impact at at 56 million hours ktb so they are mostly related to deccan volcanic eruption that outpour billions of cubic kilometers of lava spread over thousands of kilometers bringing lot of those a green houses where green house gases carbon dioxide and releases and things like that and through both direct and indirect of that deccan volcanic exam they wiped out the dinosaurs in india and with the first uh, initiation of deccan volcanic exam we see effect on uh, not only the dinosaurs uh, but also on the contemporary uh, other reptiles and importantly the uh, your uh, plant as well because right from uh, because there lot many pteridophytes starts coming over is worked out by my my colleague dr sena so this is a very important contribution that we made that the extinction of indian dinosaur is not related to the chicxulub impact at global mass extinction because we are far away from the global level it with that inter, that uh, bolide impact is is there and this is for the uh, for the students again because it's a wonderful state or top museum you can see dinosaur fossil museum in kheda if you go this uh, balasino is around 100 kilometers uh, from amdavad and then from balasino this rayoli site is hardly hardly uh, 20 kilometers and this is the museum which has come up we have further expanded that and everywhere you go the government of gujarat they have done it it's a classic state of Uh, art howdy technology museum we have we are displayed thing there are dinosaur bones over there the skeletons at the galleries that the trims are there we i said there are twenty galleries over there and all this technology we are deployed over, over there because tourism corporation of government of gujarat and of course there is a vama communication of course uh, i fortunate to be a technical consultant to them they have deployed all this technology any metrics as i showed you the digital forest virtual reality experimental lab semi circle so you can have a real uh, 
a feel of dinosaurs being there and it's a very interactive and student they enjoy a lot because it's some sort of entertainment there and this uh, we uh, first phase was there it was in 2018 early chief minister uh, viran uh, dupane ji and then this 26 june we again chief minister balaji patel he you know that and this was a phase one there were 10 galleries and we added another 10 galleries to the ground floor and it so it's a state of art and i will advise and uh, i advise all the students to make that they go and visit this studio this is i'm trying to just take you and show so some of those galleries in that regularly dinosaur film again it's a film museum but then it's so beautiful and state of art technical inside you can see right from conception of time everywhere we have depicted the thing even because this really this snake is there we also brought it in that uh, we have linked it to that uh, geo heritage excursion over there this is our raja sir sort of right from our how the earth was originated in different galleries we have displayed different themes the fossils and the interaction sections over there atm how how you can see the fossil this one phase one they are they are displayed there and then as yes, for many of the students how we do the excavations how we pack it and then these are all displayed in the museum so it's a real learning experience and as i told you it's a 5d technology uh, where we are trying to show virtual reality the semi circular projection over here Uh, you can see the dg digital forest the projection of ice thing wood lighting and even we have deep 5d theater 5d theater is something very important because it is for the first time with the japanese technologies and of course integrated chain we have brought in these all chairs which move they are dynamic chair as you are moving and then we are moving on the clouds you are seeing on the top uh, flying in the sky and you really get feel those uh, clouds and the that the, the water dogs comes there and the vapors come there and you really experience them and then suppose you are walk, go, flying over some uh, volcano the sudden temperature increase it's a real five days if you are really flying on that so it's a unique exhibition over that and then uh, thank you so much paleontological society of india uh, uh, of course who organized and of course elimina association of department of geology gunona geological society of the geological survey of india that's uh, my, my parent organization that provided me a lot of opportunity and they all the facilities they gave me and then of course thank to government of gujarat tourism corporation government of gujarat there is a lesson for all of the state governments how they can develop the power if there is a will there is a way they have a vision they have the technology and they take into consideration the latest technology and deploy it there and it is that is why it is coming i should not say but we we have already under uh, by recognition by unesco iugs and rayuli geo sites is already in the active consideration list and uh, it is um, uh, mbc sings up is there this proposal we move to paleontological society of india Yes. And they took a lot of interest. So it is one talent of the site is site is has come up there. And then of course my colleague Jeffrey Bama Communication with whom we are working. The Jeffrey Wilson, Jason Nair, of course Bandana Sam, Sumer Dumne, Alka Dumne, a very young colleague, Anup Dobe. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. So thank you very much, sir, for providing us. Uh, the in-depth information of in Indian dinosaur. It's like a complete journey you know, from the beginning uh, to the present status. You have explained it uh, in very excellent way. I think uh, this knowledge will certainly going to help all of us. Our students are also there, so this knowledge will improve uh, the the idea about the di Indian dinosaurs among the uh, students of universities and colleges. So I think uh, we are uh, uh, a bit late, but still uh, we can take few questions. One or two questions from the participants. Please raise your hands. Uh, those who want to ask the question. Yeah, Rajesh, just just a query. It is not a question. Okay. Oh, please, please, sir. Ah, I am uh, just. I wanted to know that uh, in the park area, uh, you get lot of nests, but why bones are not there? that that that's what we are working on that because after the nesting because there is a very active and uh, mass uh, nesting over there yeah there are hardly any uh, dinosaurs is you are saying the problem is there is it a story of the migration that immediately yeah. after the nesting because the volcanoes were coming they migrated to 
to the other areas maybe to the west or they migrated to to the to the north there we are still working on that but we really don't know it's a still a mystery for us why ah, the other surprising ki yeah, either they go to some specific place yes, to yes, take sir. and then they move Migrate. away yes sir. yes sir yes sir that is true and then the volcanic activity was gradually starting they wanted to go to the safer place yeah yeah and then uh, bag and this rayuli area because mm-hmm. i said that they were the first to witness the deccan volcanic eruptions so immediately start migrating sir yes. and then uh, jabalpur the eruption was in the later times mm-hmm. so that was the dinosaurs moved to that so that's what uh, we we are trying to make sir thank you dhananjay it was so thank nice you, as usual it was a wonderful Lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And no questions from students. I, I will be very. Students can ask questions. Few questions. We may take few questions. Students. Your lecture. Don't feel shy. I think Partha Sarathi sir has a has a question. Please, please, yeah. sir. <coughs> yeah, it is not a question that from Mahabey. You are yeah, a, uh, an encyclopedia yes, of dinosaurs of India. yeah i hope whatever you presented to 100 and odd people here today is uh, made available to the entire public by way of uh, a good book, pictorial book number one i also suggest uh, using the gujarat tourism department of the things to think of uh, making it a, a very lucrative film like the jurassic park uh, so mm-hmm. that it will be attractive to entire public as such yes. uh, and india and uh, one more point which i want to add is you were mentioning about uh, mr adagiri uh, who discovered yes, the gonana yes uh, dinosaur he was a junior to me in college for two years oh, great. and i uh, was also my colleague in gsi basically he did his msc geology and afterwards msc geophysics Oh. and he turned to be a great paleontologist what about paleontologist uh, hats off to him he is no more hats yeah, off to yeah, him yeah. i always thank listen you. sir thank you actually yadgiri sahab has also provided uh, when we discovered this site and we were about to take the, the excavation uh, he was there uh, to guide us sir, how we can proceed with the excavation we always remain thankful he was a real uh, dinosaur man in india sir yeah late yeah. unfortunately there sir uh there is uh, i think uh, one question from participant uh, aditya wadi bhasme please uh, i think it is there in the messages uh, i will read it shouldn't dinosaur in india die because the plants die after the uh, after uh, what is something mature heat i don't know what he has written meteorite heat in uh, north america he mean to say i think meteorite came impact no. uh, i think Yeah, I, 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 if that question is over, because I, I just mentioned that India, we have nothing to do with the impact, right. because that impact might have the influence the Deccan eruption and the style and the mechanism, but much later, our extinction shows that not only the dinosaurs, the plants, they were adversely affected by the initiation of Deccan volcanic uh, volcanism in different provinces. so of course the plants will be definitely affected so herbivores it's a complete food chain herbivores and the predators and the plants which will which will be there but mostly it's a we think that deccan volcanism is a culprit for that yeah. okay so i think Pro- professor vanjir varkar is there he, he wants to ask one question please sir yes. vanjir varkar sir i am not sir unmute yourself sir Uh-huh. sir it's very nice to hear you uh, on this august gathering sir, you, sir. Uh, i want to know sir uh, when we are gsi and uh, yeah, uh, isi that is indian statistical institute we yeah. have discovered the barbasaurus and potosaurus after that potosaurus uh, is by gsi yeah sir yeah potosaurus yeah, yeah. is by gsi yeah, yeah. Sir, sir so after that uh, do you feel that the, there is another uh, sites are uh, maybe available in nearby area yeah 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 definitely uh, yes uh, professor manjeet wadkar you are very right because i said showed you for the late cretaceous rayoli we have just excavated and just a very small part of that complete plan of the godavari valley and there are uh, the jurassic sediments which are exposed all over there 
because i think anya chatterjee and pb salulkar also were involved in uh, mapping there and there are a lot many jurisdic sediments exposed those they were and of course i had been going there and recently i think two years back we put covid because they wanted to uh, protect one and uh, develop one site that is the vardham uh, jurisdic fossil forest site that and that is linked with the jurisdic Uh, this uh, Barapasaros and Kotasaros site, we have a fish site there. So it it is an entirely tourist track there, sir. It is another museum, sir. It is another highly yeah, tourist museum. museum, but it is the only locality where you have a uh, fossil forest Jurassic fossil forest. I am telling, you yeah. can see twelve meters long trees with all the branches and that. One of my colleagues, the Pili botanist from Bandara, Dr. Kabga, there. we are working together and then we have a dinosaur uh, a lot of bones there still there uh, a lot many because we are not because it got affected because of the next selectivity they have a sites of the fishes uh, fishes exclusive fishes so there are many 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 sites so they they it can come on they they route or some sort of a track that will come under the some sort of a uh, geo site or geo tourism that we are trying to tell up but the what you ask a very pertinent question there is a lot of potentiality and finding and doing the excavations and searching for dinosaurs because for How because for botanists it took 10 years to complete it yeah yeah definitely because, yeah yeah definitely that's why i am telling gsi carried out dinosaur bones i do i come from gsi 88 83 to 85 or 2s excavation nine pits open Yeah. And there are nearly three eighty nine or four hundred bones taken, and yeah, there are still there. Except for Raja Sora and few other bones, which are described, there is a large collection which is still there, undescribed and not even prepared, because we do not have those facilities. The same thing happened to twelve hundred bones, nearly more than that, removed by the Prime Minister Statistical Institute to uh, to the because they also did a lot of field work there, excavation. They were taken to Calcutta Museum. Yes, but accepting that rival is or as nothing much came, and the thing is that now all those paleontologists which existed, they they are no more here, sir. In GSI, so in yeah. GSI they totally lack. We yeah. know a person who is having expertise in excavation, sir. We are no expertise who can work on reptiles or vertebrates. Yeah. I think uh, many of the people you being GSI, but it's it's I'm telling you it is only geological study of India still who can develop and. Uh, Take this ahead because GSI need everyone has taken a back seat, but GSI is still all young paleontologists. They have got all the potentialities, and GSI should take a list coming out of from their priorities to mineral sector, sir. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for sparing your valuable time. Thank you, sir. Uh, and, and I think I will not take more questions because the next speaker is there from Japan, so he is three and a half hours uh, ahead than the Indian standard time. The Japan is. No, uh, three and a half hours uh, ahead than the Indian time. So I think uh, he may be late. So I think without uh, you not know, taking few more questions, I would uh, also I think uh, request participants uh, to ask the questions to Mohammed Sab on email also. They can send him the email so that uh, it will save our time. I think uh, thank you very much, sir, on behalf of uh, Godwana Geological Society. Paleontological Society of India, Nagpur Student Chapter, and Alumni Association of Department of Geology, Nagpur University. I would like to thank you for your thank you, presence sir. and enlighten us on the Indian dinosaurs. That is very very interesting topic. You have explained in very lucid manner. So thank you very much, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. Thanks a lot. My honor, sir. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, sir. So now uh, we have with us uh, our next speaker, Dr. Syed uh, Azharuddin. He is there uh, uh, in Japan. So I think to introduce our speaker, I would like to request uh, Dr. Samia Umne to uh, please uh, take the mic and uh, introduce him. Please. Uh, thank you, Dr. D. M. Mohde sir. Uh, as usual, your your lecture was so amazing that we like to hear very often again and again. Uh, now I like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Syed Azruddin. Dr. Syed Azruddin is presently working as postdoctoral fellow at Graduate School of Environmental Studies, Nagoya University, Nagoya, Japan. He completed his postdoctoral uh, degree from late uh, from BHU on late Quaternary Oceanographic and Climatic Reconstructions using Foraminifera and Sediment Geochemical Signatures from the Northeastern Arabian Sea. 
and master's degree from Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, in past, he has also uh, completed his postdoctoral fellowship at lab laboratory of Ice Core and Pyroclimate School uh, of uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Seoul National University, Seoul, South Korea. And he has also completed his junior research fellowship at Birbal Sahani uh, Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow, and then SRF uh, at the same institute. He has many awards and grants uh, to his credit. Like uh, he has received Berkner Travel Fellowship, uh, that is for top 12 students or, or early career scientists, received full grant for attending American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting in 2018 at Washington, D.C. Then he has also received Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Indian, uh, India's Senior Research Fellows Fellowship at Bidbal Sahani Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow. He also received Volkswagen Stiff Tongue Grant to attend the summer school workshop entitled What Can We Learn from the Past into the Future with Stable Isotopes in Ancient and Contemporary Environments, held at University of Konstanz, Germany. He also received Pages OSU travel grant to attend Pages OC3 second workshop on ocean circulation and carbon cycling during the last glaciation, deglaciation uh, held at Oregon State University. Then he also received Pages ICTP travel grant to attend Cleaver ICTP workshop. And uh, he has very uh, unique, uh, at least eight uh, publication to his credit of very high international reviews which are published uh, in journals like Geosciences Frontiers having impact factor of 7.843, uh, then uh, paleogeography, paleoclimatology, paleoecology and like that. He, many, I mean many uh, significant publication to his credit with high impact factor journals and he has written several uh, technical reports also. And uh, his achievement is that he is in, in such a young age, he is reviewing articles for Journal of Asian Earth Sciences Elsewhere and Journal of Quaternary Sciences by Ville. He's also guest editor for a special volume entitled Carbon Cycling, Cal Climate Change and Sustainability by Sustainability and Open Access Journal by MDPI. So this is very brief introduction of our uh, speaker, Dr. Sayyad Azruddin. Uh, so Dr. Azhar, I welcome you. To please deliver the talk. Uh, Dr. Azhar, please unmute, unmute yourself. We are not able to hear you. Uh, now, is it okay? Uh, now it is fine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, long introduction. And I'm uh, truly, I'm not uh, that much worth for this long introduction introduction, but anyways, thank you so much. So uh, without wasting much time, I'm uh, going to start my uh, presentation. So I'll be speaking about uh, the general introduction about foraminifera for students. Uh, and then I'll be talking about the applications of foraminifera in paleoceanography. Basically, foraminifera has long, uh, long list of uh, applications. Uh, uh, if I start uh, uh, covering all of them, so it would take long, long time. So I'll just cover paleoceanography in which I uh, work right now, uh, and then I'll just talk about some traditional and emerging proxies in foraminifera, and and then uh, I'll follow some works which recently uh, I did uh, from the North in Northern Indian Ocean. So first of all, foraminifera for the basic introduction. Uh, foraminifera are most abundant micro, uh, one of the most abundant microfossils uh, uh, present in the marine environment. Uh, and uh, they have a life cycle of a uh, few days uh, to Dr. Rasa, please, uh, please put it on uh, slideshow mode. Oh, Your presentation uh, is not on slideshow. Oh, uh, I think it's... Is it okay now? Uh, yeah, but we are not able to see that on slideshow. Slides are visible, but uh, it is not on presentation mode. Hmm, now it is there. I think. Okay, so it is on the slideshow mode now? No. Uh, now screen is blank. Oh, uh, I don't know what's the problem. Uh, just allow me a second. I'm really sorry. Is it okay now? Uh, we are able to see the uh, slides, but uh, it is not on the presentation now. Oh, uh, I think if there is some uh, problem with. Okay, uh, then go with, go with that. Go, Sayed, go with that uh, can I interrupt in between? 
Uh, you can please, uh, yeah, you can see in down in the right hand side, there is a page like a, a, a book like option. Yeah, now it's working. Now is it okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really sorry for the interruption. So uh -huh. yeah, uh, yeah, continuing my work. Uh, so these can be studied with some basic microscope and some low power microscopes. And uh, uh, their shells are called tests, which consist of several chambers and uh, uh, which are interconnected to each other and they are called foramen and uh, that's why they are, their name is foraminifera. So uh, the basic, the most important advantage of studying foraminifera is that they have, they are uh, really present from early Cambrian to recent and uh, uh, the, uh, the peak of their uh, occurrence is in the Cenozoic uh, era. So basically there are two important groups of foraminifera uh, which uh, uh, which are uh, today. Uh, first, of the, uh, first of those are benthic foraminifera which live in uh, ocean bottom uh, as you can see in this figure. Uh, so they live along uh, the ocean, uh, in the ocean sediments or at the bottom of uh, uh, the ocean. And the other which are planktic foraminifera, they are uh, basically the surface dwellers so they live in the water column, as you can see here. So they, during their lifetime, they used to live in the water column and float and catch the water column uh, signatures. And then when they uh, die, they get buried in the uh, sediments and become the fossil. So uh, coming to the proxies, uh, which are associated with the foraminifera, there these can be divided into mainly two types. First of uh, those are biological, which are uh, like foraminifera census. Normally we uh, count the number of foraminifera and their relative assemblage and uh, absolute abundance, uh, which tells us about a lot of uh, uh, history like dep depositional environment, sea level change, and the movement of water, water mosses and thermocline conditions. And then uh, nowadays uh, there is a boom of uh, doing geochemical studies in foraminifera because these are very good indicators of, uh, of uh, surface water conditions and water column uh, signatures. So basically these are stable isotopes of carbon and ice oxygen. And then uh, nowadays there are new techniques like uh, magnesium by calcium ratio in foraminifera to study sea surface temperature and then boron isotope studies uh, are recently uh, developed to study the pH and uh, uh, CO2 uh, uh, outgassing or exchange uh, between ocean and uh, atmosphere. So basically now I'll take some studies uh, which uh, have been done uh, by me and my, uh, my uh, collaborators uh, to, uh, in, uh, to reconstruct the uh, uh, climate and oceanographic conditions uh, from several regions. So first of all, it's from Arabian Sea. Uh, this is my PhD work. Uh, I studied the core from uh, the offshore Saurashtra region uh, that is uh, that was drilled by Sagar Kan during Sagar Kanya cruise. So uh, the main objectives were to study the productivity and southwest monsoon sea level and OMZ oxygen minimum zone history uh, since the younger dry period, that is the last 12.5 uh, kilo year. Uh, so proxies which were used in this study were foraminifera assemblage and absolute abundance of foraminifera. And then biogeochemical signatures of uh, uh, planktic foraminifera, we used Globigenoids ruber. Globigenoids ruber is the uh, sp uh, species of planktic foraminifera, which are uh, basically found in the uppermost part of the water column. So that's why they are uh, able to uh, record the the water uh, sea surface uh, signatures and then uh, we use the most developed uh, size fraction that is 250 to 355 uh, for our studies and then uh, we use 10 to 20 specimen for oxygen isotope measurement and then uh, uh, more species were uh, more specimens were used for uh, mgca uh, ratio measurement and uh, uh, boron isotope measurement which we did recently with collaboration with uh, uk lab uh, and then uh, let me tell you some basics about these uh, isotopic studies. So basically oxygen isotope is the ratio of uh, oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which are measured in the sample and the standard. And uh, they are basically, uh, th uh, they are basically uh, indicative of the dry and wet climates over the past. 
And then uh, the next proxy is the MG by CA ratio, uh, which we couple with delta 18 uh, of the uh, delta 18 signatures to find the sea surface temperature, as you can see in these equations, that SST uh, might be calculated with uh, the MG by CA ratio. And if we get if we get the SST, we can actually deduce the delta 18 O seawater. That is like at that time, what was the 18 O signature of the seawater? And then with this, we can actually calculate the past sea salinity also, uh, uh, which are uh, through this equation. And then uh, coming to the boron isotopes, uh, boron isotopes are estimated uh, uh, are, uh, are estimated through uh, uh, the um, planktic foraminifera to give the information about pH and uh, past uh, PCO2 uh, reconstructions. And we use this equation for these and uh, Coming to uh, the results, uh, this uh, work was published in 2017 in Paleo 3, and then here we did uh, the we analyzed the P by B ratio, that is planktic by benthic foraminiferal ratio, which is a very good indicator of uh, uh, of uh, sea level and the Paleo water depth. And you can see at the right side figure that this is the planktic by benthic foraminiferal ratio, and this uh, this the borderline between planktic and benthic is basically the uh, indicator of water depth and we can see that actually uh, the change in uh, paleo uh, sea level during several abrupt events that is due, during the younger dries and then uh, there is one more event which uh, which we uh, named as a uh, during uh, the, the during that time the uh, sea level was down and then at the 8.2 kilo year event uh, where, which was a global event and at that time there was a drying period for the uh, for the uh, like almost all the northern hemisphere uh, records and then we got the uh, uh, holocene sea level maximum which is uh, uh, around at 5.5 uh, kilo year and this is uh, holocene sea level maximum is recorded in other uh, sea level studies uh, uh, in india and uh, elsewhere also uh, so the main highlights of this research were uh, the progressive freshening of the basin was observed uh, during the Holocene, which possibly uh, related to the Southwest monsoon intensification. And then uh, these, uh, uh, these Southwest monsoon signatures were show a weaker monsoon during younger dryas and early Holocene period. And, uh, and then uh, it intensified uh, during middle and late Holocene. And similar is the situation for sea level also, as I uh, showed earlier that uh, during early Holocene, the sea level was lower, but then it uh, uh, increased and reached to the Holocene sea level maximum during this time. So second study we published recently, it is basically led by my uh, PhD supervisor, uh, Dr. Pawan Google, uh, and I'm the co-author of this uh, paper. And the, we, the, here we studied a record from, uh, uh, from Bay of Bengal, and uh, the core was actually uh, uh, telling the, uh, showing the record of up to uh, uh, past 6,000 years, but it shows a very high uh, resolution record. And as you can see that there are lots of up and downs in this record, which shows a lot of dry and wet periods uh, during the past 6,000 years. And we also used uh, foraminifera sensors and the foraminifera assemblage, uh, absolute uh, abundance of uh, G-Ruber and then Globigerinite saccharifer and uh, bulloids and then uh, uh, and deuter tree. So, all of these four different species show different type of conditions in the water column. For example, G. Ruber shows uh, the uh, water column uh, productivity at the topmost uh, uh, topmost uh, part, and G. Bulloids is mainly the indicator of the uh, the uh, upwelling in the area uh, and stratification conditions. So basically, the results of this study were the variation of southwest monsoon over the surface circulation in the Bay of Bengal. And the reduction of flux uh, was observed during 5.9 to 3.7 kilo year, and then progressive increase in freshwater flux is observed around 3.7 kilo year. And then we recorded uh, two very important events, which are marked in other studies also. We recorded uh, uh, RWP, that is Roman warm period, and uh, MWP uh, in uh, extreme events. Uh, which showed the changes in uh, changes in monsoon and uh, related uh, water influx in our area in the West, Western Bay of Bengal region. So uh, we also did some studies with uh, uh, with uh, um, 
spectral analysis and statistical studies in our foraminiferal data and published this work in 2019 in Geoscience Frontiers. Uh, so this was also a part of my PhD thesis. And then uh, here we uh, did uh, spectral analysis and spectral analysis actually showed that there is a 256 years uh, cycle in the monsoon, which is recorded in mostly all of our data. And that shows that there is a, uh, a uh, there is a strong influence of solar insulation in uh, the southwest uh, to the southwest monsoon, and it shows signatures of such uh, cycles in uh, our area in the northeastern Arabian Sea. So uh, recently, uh, we did work uh, with our old core from the Arabian Sea, which was my PhD part, but this work was done uh, later on after my PhD. Uh, so we uh, collaborated with, uh, uh, with Professor Gavin Foster at uh, uh, University of Southampton. And there we analyzed uh, the MG by CA ratio in foraminifera and then boron isotopes also uh, for the last 8,000 years. And uh, you can see that it, there are only these records which are available worldwide in the world ocean. So this proxy has got uh, a lot of potential in future because, because in the era of uh, uh, global warming and we are concerning about uh, the past PCO2 changes, we should have more records from other uh, regions. So basically this, uh, uh, this work shows the uh, sea surface temperature we calculated and it shows the, that the basin had the sea surface temperature of uh, between two, 26 and 30 uh, degrees Celsius uh, during past 8,000 years. And uh, then uh, we recorded two important events uh, during last 8,000 years where uh, you can see that uh, the pH of the area became very, very uh, uh, low. Uh, that means it, it, the water became very acidic uh, and then uh, uh, like much acidic than is the normal uh, uh, concentration. And then uh, if the water, seawater becomes more acidic, then there would be more uh, CO2 uh, going to the atmosphere, uh, which caused global warming. So that's why nowadays it's a global concern of uh, ocean acidification and uh, greenhouse effect. So uh, we compared our records, this blue color in the Indian Ocean Panel is our uh, records, uh, and it is uh, among the most uh, high resolution record for the last 8,000 years uh, in the world right now. Uh, so as you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, during, uh, uh, during these two events, there was very high CO2, which, go, which went into, into the atmosphere from this region. So we tried to, uh, to explore that what could be the reason of such high, such high PCO2 uh, events in this uh, region. So uh, we, uh, uh, we compared these events with the El Nino Southern oscillation activity in the Pacific, because it is well observed that there are a lot of atmospheric uh, uh, teleconnections, which, uh, which are responsible for changes in ocean and atmospheric signatures. So uh, as you can see that this dotted line is the change in, uh, uh, and so, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and we observe that whenever there is a high end, like long term and so activity, which went for the years, like more than uh, uh, 10 years. So there is a change in uh, the, uh, the pH of the area, which caused high, uh, like high outgassing in the Arabian Sea. So as you can see that they have like very good uh, corroboration with each other. So basically the final uh, output of this research was that Northeastern Arabian Sea was overall a sink, as you can see in this previous slide, Overall, uh, there, uh, the concentration was below zero. Uh, 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 the PCO2 was below zero. Uh, so that means that overall it was a sink. But during these two uh, periods, the, the, there was high CO2 outgassing from the region, which made the region as a source. So the high PCO2 episodes are also characterized by strong acidification in the region. So this was uh, about this paper. So I'll finish my talk with this, these words. And I would be happy to take the questions from students and all the dignitaries here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Paleontological Society of India and Guru and Azulological Society for giving me this opportunity. And then uh, I would like uh, to thank my supervisors, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Edi Singh and Dr. Pawan Google. And then uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Sub DST and CSIR for their research grants, which helped me to uh, do that research in, at BSIP. And then my collaborators who uh, were always there uh, to guide me uh, during all the work. 
So thank you very much. Uh, I'd be happy to take the questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Syed. Uh, excellent uh, talk. I think uh, uh, student uh, they are uh, now asked you questions. Uh, Dr. Azhar, uh, may I request you one thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, please uh, do one thing that kindly explain students that how uh, you have done your geochemical studies of with respect to the foraminifera because students have this general concept in their mind that the micropilentologist or paleontologist they do not do other they do not consider other thing uh, they just do the taxonomy thing and morphology of the particular fossils etc so tell them something about how you have co correlated your data uh, the micropilentological data that is the foraminal data with the uh, your geochemical data I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. Actually, yes, uh, foraminifera is like very old uh, uh, proxy and very reliable proxy uh, since like so many years, so many decades uh, right now. And uh, yeah, foraminifera, old foraminifera scientists, like very uh, veteran scientists, they did a lot of work to establish this and study the depositional environment and a lot of things. Uh, yes, uh, but nowadays, uh, if we study the uh, if we study the geochemical signatures so they can give uh, the, a better support to the whatever uh, the uh, uh, whatever the assemblage data can tell us for example that uh, uh, as you as i showed you in this graph that yes presence of these uh, uh, foraminifera tells us that the water was warm and uh, the water like uh, thermocline what was the thermocline condition in the basin and uh, what was the like overall water mass conditions. So studying foraminifera assemblage uh, gives us idea about this very strong idea. But if we want to uh, quantify it, so uh, we use basically use uh, MG by CA ratio. So uh, as you uh, as you have seen in my data that uh, with the by using MG by CA ratio, we can actually tell that what was the change in temperature on degree Celsius. So basically, yes, these numbers are like giving support to what uh, the uh, foraminifera assemblage were telling us. So this is how we uh, we take uh, both uh, foraminifera assemblage and uh, and sensors and uh, all those data. And uh, with the help of geochemical uh, uh, signatures, we can be more precise ab about our inferences. And then we can uh, just um, be more quantitative about our research. So I hope you got my uh, point. Uh, so if there is any question, I would be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, some, Dr. Samaya, may I add something to what you said? Yes, sir. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. The, this, uh, the geochemical proxies are so important in recent years. Over the last 10 years, we have been... Uh, trying to use it for our oil exploration purpose also. And uh, many times these proxies, they were used in the stratigraphy as well as paleoecology or the paleoenvironmental determinations. In fact, we had opened up a so, something called chemostratigraphy also there. So we were relating all these geochemical proxies to the biostratigraphy as well as other, other types. Of. So it's a very good science. It's a, it should be used, I think. Yeah. In, a, in a bigger way. Right. Uh, Dr. Sayed, I think, uh, can you enlighten uh, our student, uh, uh, especially with the use of uh, stable isotope, oxygen isotope, you have mentioned about O18 and O16. Uh, yes. So far, uh, to identify the warm and uh, no, cold events. Yes, so yes, yes. Uh, I'll just explain yeah. it for the benefit of our students. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, uh, I think this one would be great. Yes, so basically oxygen, uh, 16 oxygen have two types of isotopes, uh, 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 two types of isotopes basically, which we use, uh, all, uh, although it has three, but we use oxygen 16 and oxygen 18 ratio because they, these are the two most abundant uh, specimen of oxygen. So basically uh, the ratio by, uh, by which the oxygen 18 
to oxygen 16 change in a sample tells us about the how uh, the uh, uh, like about how the precipitation and uh, uh, evaporation cycle has worked in some region in the in terms of uh, uh, in, the, in term of uh, a basin so when we use this uh, with the uh, with reference to standard so basically as you can see that uh, the delta 18 you know, in the whenever there is a warm period and wet period uh, there would be more delta 6 Delta, uh, uh, there will be more uh, oxygen 16 in the system. So the delta 18 O signatures will go more negative. And then if there is a dry period, then the delta 18 uh, O uh, uh, increases in the system. So you can see that during the dry periods, there is, uh, as you can see here also, during the dry periods, that is younger dryas and 8.2, these are, are very known dry periods. And as you can see that during these periods, the delta 18 O signatures are getting less negative. That means uh, there is an increase in delta 18 and uh, decrease in oxygen 60. So uh, like in terms of ratio and then uh, in term, uh, and if there is any uh, wet period uh, or uh, uh, then, then that will be recorded in more negative values of Delta 18 O signatures. So I hope that answers your question. Right. Right. Thank you, thank you. I think there is one question from uh, Kundan Borkar. Uh, I think Kundan, uh, you may ask the question. Yeah. Kundan, are you there? Okay, I think uh, there is no question from his side. So, if uh, there are no questions, then uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sayed, for uh, enlightening us on a very important and emerging topic in the paleoceanography, uh, especially the monsoonal studies and uh, various episodes you have explained in very nice way with the uh, different event. Uh, uh, very thank you so manner. much for so giving me this chance. For your, yeah. For your uh, thank you so and much, accepting yeah. our invitation to deliver a talk. Thanks yeah, a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. So, can we move to our next speaker? Yes. Yes. Before moving to next speaker, I would like to thank you, Dr. Sayyad Azruddin, that you, you accepted our invitation to deliver the talk in very short span of time. I think just uh, one day before uh, you, have, you got the intimation to give the talk. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, delivering the talk so nicely and very well. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Arindam Chakrabarti. Dr. Arindam Chakrabarti, you are here. Dr. Arindam? Dr. Yes, Arindam Chakrabarti? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Arindam Chakrabarti is presently pursuing postdoctoral fellowship at Stable Isotope Laboratory, Institute of Earth Sciences, Academia, Sinica, Taiwan. He is uh, having uh, his research interest in origin and evaluation of biota, biostratigraphy, and paleoclimatic studies and effects of climate change on marine biota and also on reconstruction of past seasonality through triple oxygen and silicon isotope. Uh, he has many things to his credit. Uh, he is elected as member members secretary for the Micropaleontological Society of United Kingdom in 2021. He is also elected as coordination committee member for NC Eclimb ECR 2021, uh, elected as a fellow of Young Academy of India. He is selected as a scientific advisor for Let's Do in Let's Do It India. Also selected as National Postdoctoral Fellow at Dirbal Sahani Research Associate. Selected as Shibpur Scientist uh, from Paleontology Division for IUDP Expedition 378. He is selected as Newton Bhabha Fellow and Bug at UCL London. He is, he is also selected as DST Inspire Fellow and ISR Kolkata Summer Fellowship Program. And he has completed his PhD from BSRP Lucknow and University of Burdwan, India. He has uh, almost 30 research publications to his credit with a cumulative impact factor of 
and he almost attended 36 uh, national and international seminars and uh, same art same number of articles to his credit he is uh, uh, he has done his uh, iodp project on diatom and silicoflagellate biostratigraphy and their implications on paleoclimate from early paleocene to oligocene of site u1553 south pacific ocean in the in uh, in iodp expedition 378 and he is member of uh, the paleontological society of india then neogen climate evolution and in eurasia uh, also coordination committee member of nipplang ecr uh, and he has received kushman foundation uh, post doctoral member of uh, kushman foundation for foraminiferal research uh, an annual member of international society for diatom research and also a life member of association of polar pol- early polar career scientist uh, and also the member of many micropaleontological society so with this a very brief di- uh, bio data i would like to invite dr anindam chakrabarti to give us talk thank you humana ma'am for the uh, introduction uh, i guess everyone can and uh, see the uh, full screen yes okay so first of all uh, the fossils aren't just an interesting and fun to look at they are also a proof of the existence of the past so and these fossils are the uh, are present from last billions of years so uh, we can even take a look at the animals and the life forms that no longer exist uh, on this planet now and this deserves to be preserved and explored so that's why we celebrate this international fossil day and why this international fossil day is important to all of us uh, so we can learn about our planet we can and uh, understand the progression of the time how it uh, it went from this bacterial to the human being now and we can also look towards the future so for this we need to save the fossil localities and uh, psi uh, with the help of Uh, gondwana geological society and rtm nagpur university is organizing this seminar today uh, so my topic uh, is a little bit different from the other two past uh, we have heard from mohabe sir about the dinosaurs which is really fascinating and then from my junior colleague uh, at bsip sayed about the foraminifers which is which are really important for the oceans and now i will take you to the siliceous and other forms of calcareous as uh, micro fossils which are also present in the oceans so now you can see by the topic name is the past environment of the emerald islands of india so uh, india is uh, has two uh, oceans one, uh, two seas and one ocean that's one is bay of bengal the uh, arabian sea and the indian ocean so the bay of bengal uh, consists uh, of a islandic group there which is known as the andaman and nicobar group and the waters are really greenish blue so it's known as the emerald islands of india and the biodiversity is uh, is like fabulous there and the evid- and we 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 studied this past environment with the help of the evidences from the white and black box fossils so what are white and black box first of all so the black box means when when we just see the fossil slides under the microscope we see the normally we see the uh, a white color background and the fossils and the 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 micro fossils so these are the calcareous or uh, the the mainly the uh, siliceous micro fossils that i will talk about the diatoms and the radiolarians and the black ones are the when you uh, for studying the calcareous nano fossils you have to uh, have a black background and and to see the calcareous and for so i termed these two as white and black box microfossils so first of all what is the paleo geography of the island uh, that is present uh, and in the eastern side of, uh, of india that is andaman nicobar so you can see during the uh, eocene time around 50 million years when the india uh, just uh, drifted from the southern uh, hemisphere and then uh, struck with the eurasian plate in the northern hemisphere so the then the himalayans were the, the building and at the same time the islandic chain of, uh, of andaman and nicobar came up and then you can see the bengal fan formation during the 15 million years uh, and then this is the present and day 
uh, paleogeography of India and the Andaman Nicobar Island, which is a connection from the Himalaya to the Arakan Yuma range here. So this for the students, this, uh, because I will be talking mostly about the Neogene part uh, under the Cenozoic time period. So the, the sediments here in Andamans are mainly of Miocene, Pliocene, and, and Pleistocene that, that we will uh, be studying in detail. So it's the complete disappearance of Tethys Sea occurred here, and the, the Himalayas uplifted the Bengal's uh, deep sea fan occur. Uh, the it was formation, and several or uh, the change the changes in the oceanic circulation. So you can see the geological evolution how this island and uh, evolved from the sea. So the late Cretaceous we we see the late Cretaceous Radiolarian charts uh, at the base. And which are deep ocean marine species, and then the uh, then we come the late Cretaceous to Paleocene and rocks, which have the uh, intrusions of the uh, basic and ultra basic intrusion and rocks of Baratan group, which are dark shells, sealstones, and limestones. The late then comes the late Paleocene to Eocene and deposition of Mimitakari and Baratan group. Uh, and there was unconformity after this due to the plate motion, and then uh, there was deposition of late Eocene to Oligocene, which was deposited for Port Blair group or Andaman Flish, which is one of the thickest of all the sequences present in, in this group of island. And there, there, is, there is again unconformity from the this uh, is Andaman Flish to the uh, Archipelago series, which is the most recent and uh, biogenic sediments that is deposited in the Andaman groups. So now, what are microfossils? It's it is studied under light or electron microscope, and its size is less than two uh, millimolar. The study of this division uh, of paleontology is known as micropaleontology, and there are two types of microfossils: inorganic and organic. And I will be mainly discussing today about the calcareous and the diatoms, calcareous nanofossils and the diatoms. So the diatoms are the unicellular photosynthetic algae. The size is 20 to 200 microns, and it's, uh, it's occupied the photic zone that we all know, and it's present in marine and freshwater. The first appeared in the Mesozoic era during the Jurassic, and then the calcareous nanofossils, it's uh, less than 30 microns. It's marine, and late Triassic is to the recent the geological range. So the... The, the lithostratigraphy, if you divide in a like a broad way, then the northern region of the Andaman Islands have the creamish yellowish chalk with numerous volcanic uh, ash layers, and the southern region has the calcareous mudstones and the limestones. So here is the deposition environment of the Miocene. You can see the how it changes the chalk and then the limestone, the silty mudstone here, the mudstone, and with again the limestone and uh, coming up at the Pleistocene and uh, late Pliocene. So I will be talking in three different uh, stages. One is the latest early to early middle Miocene, that is the Bardigalian uh, Cerevelian here. So this is the uh, largest island of the uh, archipelago uh, group here, uh, which is the Havelock Island. So this is the this sediment. These are the three outcrops that we. Uh, studied from the Havelock Island. These sediments are dominated by the nanoforum chalks mainly uh, and mudstones. And based on the lithology, we have two types of formations here. One is English and the long formation, where the latter one has seal stones mainly. Uh, and here you can see that uh, with the help of diatoms, we just uh, made a diatom zonation here. Uh, sometimes it's with help of diatoms, it's really hard to get the marker forms. Uh, but we, we have a good diversity, but we don't get the marker forms very rare. So we were fortunate to get the marker forms in this period. And the initial uh, in the Bardigalian Langian and part, we got the Cestoriscus peplum zone. And then in the Langian Cerevelian, we got the Cosmoriscus levisianus zone. So here you can see the this is the uh, Cestoriscus peplum and this is Cosmoriscus levisianus. And it's very well preserved. So here, with the help of, again, to reconfirmation uh, uh, of these ages and all, we do a multi-proxy studies. And this is the radiolarian events that my colleagues and we did uh, recently uh, after my uh, PhD. So this, we, we have the same, um, same samples and the same sections. And we saw that one of our, uh, the, the, the Lacan point section is, 
uh, is here in the Langian Cerebellian boundary. And here you can see with the nanofossils, we didn't got any uh, cerebellian, and here we got the cerebellian boundary, Langian cerebellian, but with the nanofossils, everything is within this range. That's the Burdiginian, Langian, and boundary here, but we didn't got anything more. And these are the marker forms that I have mentioned here. And with the help of this nanofossils, we try to uh, get the paleo environment, which shows that the warm tropical condition, which can be correlated with the middle Miocene climate optimum, the dominance of the deep water forms um, to the marginal sea forms, uh, or again, the marginal to deep water here in the upper side uh, shows that there was a nutricline condition also, and deposition was in the epicontinental marginal sea. And there was a very low uh, sedimentation rate here, uh, around 25 uh, meter per million years. So these are the warm water assemblage uh, of diatoms from the uh, these out three outcrops. And these are some of the, uh, the, the, the marker forms, the Rosiella palissy also, which is a marker of the middle Miocene. And these are the three sections which you can see that we divided into a different types of, we understand the ecology of the region and the environment, and it shows the deep water, shallow water, and intermediate water around its fluctuates between that. And the radiolinear diversity. So this is a study uh, we did recently, uh, and it shows that there was a high diversity uh, of uh, radiolarian during this time. The weight analysis of the radiolarian shows that the warm water uh, again dominates, and all the three sections shows there is a corresponding shift towards uh, higher values of uh, this is the young, uh, older sample, and this is the younger sample. So there is a, a, the higher values uh, that implies lower export productivity. And, and the, the present study also confirms that during the late early to the early middle Miocene, warm water radiolarians were overwhelmingly dominant that may be correlated to the PCO uh, event, uh, the, uh, with the MCO event, sorry. The, the paleo uh, bathymetry, both the nasillaria, the blue one is nasillaria and the spumular, these are the two groups of radiolarians and, and these both are abundant. However, the forms be belonging to nasillaria are marginally, these blue ones are marginally dominant in some instances. The marginal dominance of this group is in some instances indicates that the deposition took place in a slightly deep water setting to the marginal seas. So in summary, uh, we have a warming phase of Miocene during this time. The MCO warmth was triggered also by the closure of the Indonesian uh, through flow, the, 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 the Indonesian seaway, and the influx of the Tethian Indian saline water was also there during this time. As the paleobathymetry and the paleogeography of this time are not much different from the present day, so this may be a clue to predict the present day global warming events too. So then comes to the late Miocene which is the Tortonian. So these are the two uh, sections that we studied there. So these are the well-preserved diatoms. And we got uh, around two assemblage zones in the first east coast. And then in the second and in the uh, cave point section, we got 61 species and we did some um, CONIS analysis, cluster analysis, and the SHB analysis, which shows that precisely how can we zone the uh, that outcrops together. And we also uh, saw, uh, saw that the assemblage was suggest a warm water condition of the tropical region, and the preservation of the was uh, good here. And the grain size also suggests that there was low energy deposition. The bathymetry is deeper as the planktonic forms are more and which became uh, relatively shallower in the upper part of the uh, outcrop. So here in the cave point section also, we have more dominance of planktonic diatoms. So we did uh, multi-proxy uh, biostratigraphy here with the radiolarians, with the diatoms and the uh, nanofossil, but the diatoms were, uh, marker forms were not present. And so we have an assemblage, but we could not get any marker forms of this time. So we dated with uh, it with the calcareous nanofossils and the uh, radiolarians. So these are the diatoms of the um, cave point section. 
So here in the cave point section, we saw that the thalassinema, nystioides, and paralia sulcata, and this assemblage shows uh, these are the upwelling taxa with the uh, cold water forms, cosinuriscus marginatus, and paralia sulcata here. So this too uh, shows that there was a higher primary productivity also, like there was a bloom of this thalassinema and nystioides. And both tells us that the, uh, there was uh, intensification of monsoon during this uh, time. And the nutrient rich sediment flux was from towards the Ayurvedi River. Uh, and the, with the calcareous nanofossils, we, uh, we saw that the, there was a low abundance of discoisters and high abundance of small reticular fenestries, which also indicates that there was a coastal upwelling. And this eventually suggests there was a nutrient rich condition also. And the, when the onset of uh, high productivity surface water was linked with the intensification of the uh, Indian summer monsoon around 8 million years ago. The overall assemblage uh, were deposited in a marginal sea setting and the sedimentation rate were pretty high during this time. It is around 200 meter per million years. The Tortonian uh, assemblage also impl uh, implies a nutric line conditions here with the basis of the assemblage that we got. Then we come to the early Pliocene sediments here that the Xanclean. So this was uh, the sediments from the Car Nicobar Island, which is the northernmost island of Nicobar group. And it is made up of the, uh, the said lithology is mudstone and limestones. So here are the two uh, sections, which is pretty nearby. Uh, and in one section in the Savai Bay A section, and uh, this section, we didn't got any of the diatoms uh, here. So, but uh, we got some diatoms, some siliceous microfossils here uh, in the Savai Bay B, B section. And we try to do the calcareous nanofossil zonations here and with the radiolarians. So it is as NN12 zone and NN13 also in the Savai Bay B section. And Savai Bay A section is fully NN12. And this is NN12 and NN13. So these are the diatoms, the radiolarians, the, and we have some spawn spicules and silico flagellates also here. And these are the calcareous nanofossils you can see. So the siliceous microfossils were mostly dominated by the radiolarians, the black bars here, and the spawn spicules was also there. And as we know from the Cawthon et al. study that there was a biogenic silica crash also during this time. So we can uh, we can think of this silica crash, but uh, since we don't have a continuous sedimentation of the uh, Miocene to uh, Zanclean, uh, Miocene to Pliocene and boundary, so we cannot tell this very correctly that there was a crash or not. It may not be preserved also. So and it was mostly dominated by the shallow water forms, the spumelarians here. So with the help of the calcareous nanofossils, uh, there was an increase in the discoisters here, uh, here in the upper part, uh, which is comparison. And it is can be inferred that the region was deepening. So it, it was shallower here and it was deepening in this, in the upper part, which may be correlated to the global sea level transgression during the uh, Zanclean. And the estimated sedimentation rate was 80 million years, which again degraded from the late Miocene. So these are some of the disquiesters, the ACM pictures of some of the cuculithophores here, the cuculiths and the uh, disquiesters. So in conclusion, I, I am just concluding according to the age, like the late Miocene, we can, uh, it's Langean to Cerevelian here, and there was ab reduced abundance, and it may be due to dissolution or poor preservation due to high temperature and effect of dissolution maybe. So the best on the nanofossils also, it shows that the uh, warm tropical and neutrical, uh, neutricline condition, and there was influence of uh, MCO event. The planktic benthic ratio of the diatom indicates there was evidence of the sea level fluctuations and this deposition and a more in a bigger form, if you see the deposition took place in a deep water uh, environment. During the late Miocene, we have the multiple microfossil analysis of the shows that the age is Tortonian. The planktonic diatoms were more abundant and there was a bloom also of planktonic diatoms and nutrients. So it increases the nutrient and reach of the water and it's resulted to a high amount of terrigenous input uh, due to the uh, in intensification of the uh, um, uh, intensification of the Indian summer monsoon.
And in the early Pliocene, it is mostly dominated by the shallow water taxa of diatoms and radiolarians. And it is the, the radiolarians are the main contributors to the biogenic opal. And it is due to the selective dissolution of the uh, particular uh, group. And the water temperature changes induced by the uh, monsoons here that could be developed periodical gaias or local upwelling in this region. And the decline in the diatom abundance may be due to the shift in the opal accumulation from the equatorial region to the Antarctic convergence zone. And this can also be correlated uh, to the uh, widespread biogenic silica crash around 6 MA and the closure of the Indonesian through flow also. So at last, I thank you. Uh, thanks, B BSIP, uh, Inspire Division, British Council, UCL, uh, ACRB, and Andaman Eco Administration, and, and definitely my supervisors uh, and the director of the institute there in India and also the coordinators and Humane ma'am and, and for inviting me for this uh, lecture today and the, uh, this gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvindam. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, did you record uh, uh, warm or cool events during the neogene based on diatoms? If uh, you have recorded, then how many events are there? During the neogene, especially, Miss Warmer and yeah. Cool, cool. So yeah. Uh, so in neogene, we have uh, like uh, the, the according to the sedimentation in the islands that we worked. One was in the middle Miocene, and which we it was warm definitely, and then in the late Miocene, the Tortonian, we have the uh, warm and humid. It's we have the cooler forms, but it is uh, is due to the upwelling. So it's not cool. The water was warm, but it was humid due to the uh, Indian summer monsoon. And again, in the uh, early Pliocene, you see in the Xanthian, we have the warm dominant. So mostly, if you tell, in the it is a warm dominant and uh, species according to the diatoms. Okay, which are the main sp species you have found there? Main species of diatoms? Of which age? So no, 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 no. Age... diatoms, you, what you say, no. Yeah, it's, it's like in the uh, initial, uh, in the middle Miocene, we have the Rosiella palissy, which is a marker of that time. Okay. Um, and Cestodiscus, Peplum, Cosmodiscus, Levisianus, these are the markers of middle Miocene. And then in the, in we, the diversity increases during the Xanthian. We have lots of diatoms in uh, during the Tortonian, and which was dominated by Cosmodiscus uh, species mainly. And with the thalassonema, it was dominant, like thalassonema, uh, long pinnate diatoms. So the uh, do dominance of these diatoms has affected the radiolarian population during that time? Or, uh, the radiolarian population uh, was, I am telling in middle Miocene first, there was very bad preservation initially, but we got some good diatom forms, but mostly it was not uh, dissoluted forms. But in okay. And uh, the radiolarians during the uh, Xanclean and the Tortonian are much better. But the Xanclean, the radiolarian percentage increased, which dominated and the diatoms was decreased. So that that, that we saw. During, which, yeah. It is a competition between maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or it may be due to dissolution, uh, the preservation factor also. Because when we published in his, uh, this one, so the, our reviewer told that you cannot tell it like uh, it is a biogenic silica crash or something like that. You must tell that there may be the dissolution factor and yeah, it may that, not be I think preserved. dissolution is also one of the important factors. Yeah. That is. So it's like a constraint for right, us. Right. Very interesting work. Keep it up. Thank you. And now I am I am just in, including my diatom here for like in Taiwan, I will be working on the silicon isotopes of those diatoms and all. Here. So have you and started uh, separating the pure, uh, yeah. pure di diatom silica? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Already I have, uh, it's working on. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks Thank for Thank you. Uh, Dr. Arendam, please uh, tell something about silicon isotope uh, analysis and its interpretation. Uh, since it's pretty, like you, you may be knowing that I, I was basically a micropalaeontologist before, and I just uh, had a project in mind that I will be doing some isotopic analysis of the diatoms. So I just started, uh, so I, don't, I, I may not have a good constructive idea of the silicon. I just now, what, what I am doing now is uh, isolating the diatoms from the sediments and uh, with some uh, um, procedures, a long procedure around two weeks. So with yeah. the help of uh, SPT also, like we, we have now uh, pure diatoms that, that we can see. But yeah. uh, there are some very hard things 
for because we are first trying for the O17 here with the diatom. Okay. And that's again a constraint, like very rare people work on that. And silicon iso we will be doing. Still, we have not done th those things. Like it's so pretty. We are, early, we, like, we are also interested to know about the silicon isotope. We are also working here. On Definitely that. next next time. I I I'm pretty uh, I'm new, so I, I don't want to comment okay, anything no. like wrong things here. No, no issue, no issue. I think so, there is another question from uh, Himanshu Mishra. Uh, I think yeah. he may ask the question. Himanshu, are you there? Himanshu Mishra. Tell him to unmute. I think he has raised his hand. Uh, please unmute. Himanshu, please unmute. Maybe he is mistakenly. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So over to Dr. Samia now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arindam Chakrabarti, for this yeah. very lucid talk and very interesting talk. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Bandna Saman Man and Dr. Bandna Saman Madam. Uh, as she is very close to me, I'm... I always forgot to ask for her CV and very much sorry that I'm not having her CV also because I meet her daily. We talk a lot, but I forgot to talk about this topic that ma'am kindly provide me your CV. So uh, still <laughs> no I know her very well and uh, she is a very eminent scientist in the field of palynology. She is uh, having more than, uh, I think, 25 years of research experience, uh, she started her career from Varya Institute of Himalayan Geology as project fellow and then uh, con continuously involved in uh, getting women scientists program and uh, working on different projects. And earlier she was there as faculty in Banaras Hindu University and uh, then she joined Department of Geology in 2009. Now she is professor and uh, she has many publications to her credit. Uh, I think it is near about 50 city. So, Madam, it will be my pleasure to invite you to give you special talk. Okay. Thank you very much, and Dr. Samia Homne. And I think, can you see my screen is visible or not? It is not, I think. Uh, madam, your screen is visible, but uh, screen. Uh, screen is visible, but presentation okay. was not there. Okay. And good evening, everyone. Um, uh, now it is visible. Huh? Okay. So, good evening, MP Singh sir, Sudhi Shukla sir, Chatterjee sir, Sarulkar sir, Mohave sir, and my colleagues, Samia Humne, Dr. Humne, and my dear students. So, today I'm... Um, I'm presenting here on the topic that fossils thermometer of a planet is just to tell you our students that how these plants or uh, animals they are useful for for understanding the past climate. So uh, as you know, these plants and animals they evolved gradually and from unicellular organism to multicellular from uh, from um, this uh, uh, amphibians to mammals and then similar animals from uh, small um, algae to to its present day flourishing uh, angiosperms so as you know that all we in uh, this pla our planet they, it has also seen many extinctions and effect of this extinction is mainly on biota that is plants and animals and this all extinctions are related to whether it's by bolide impact or decon volcanic activity any kind of volcanic activity its major impact is on climate and environment which affects the biota so study of biota is mainly our aim and biota is very uh, much there to in which the these climatic events are well preserved so as you know there are 
mostly five uh, five extinction events and uh, most of them uh, means bigger of them are permian triassic and cretaceous tertiary boundary these these two extinction events are the considered the major which affected the very large amount of biota so around 95% in permian triassic and around uh, 75% in cretaceous so here i will focus as uh, before the start of this lecture the tasar was saying that there is not much work on the on the plants and um, so i'm just trying to focus on the what is the significance of plants how plants are very useful in understanding the past climate and depositional environment um, and they are very good proxies for understanding the changing climatic conditions because they are sessile in nature they cannot move from their uh, position either they live in that or they die so uh, when we study plants we uh, study plants larger plants as a whole or or part of the plant that is which which is called palynology in which we study pollen and spores so uh, for the growth of the plants availability of light temperature precipitation moisture contents and soil types these are important things and out of these temperature and precipitations are considered as very important for growth and development of any plant uh, plants in any environment so as we all know there are many climatic zones depending upon the climatic conditions we have tropical climates then tropical savanna monsoonal climates depending upon the temperature and precipitation conditions and um, we have higher altitude plant this is mainly for actually to explain to our students that how plants are important in telling about the climates you all know we have different plants types of plants in higher altitude on snow bound areas and then we have plants which show desert conditions we have plants which are uh, tropical plants which are also these tropical rainforest which which are mostly present around around the um, zero degree uh, and they are also considered as the lungs of our planet because they control all the co2 concentration biota biodiversity and all these and greenhouse effect and uh, controlling the uh, mons uh, monsoonal condition uh, and precipitation all these and uh, they, so they are considered as the very lungs of our planet uh, we have plants which grow in the lake conditions like water lilies we have lotus which grows in fresh water conditions and plants which are close to the edges of the lakes and then away from it so by seeing the plants of what type of plants we can say they they are they derived from from uh, autochthonous or they have come from outside so all these things help in reconstruction uh, reconstruction of the climate and depositional environmental conditions so now i will tell you some what are the uh, things which are uh, now going on, going on to understand the climate and uh, now uh, studies are uh, going on to tell the uh, uh, quantitative analysis means if we say warm how much warm how much precipitation is there so for this uh, we are taking into nearest re re living relative that is we compare the fossil with the living and then uh, we try to understand in what temperature pressure temperature precipitation conditions that uh, plant is growing and then we try to tell about the uh, of, then we take into the past and then try to assess the temperature pressure conditions warm conditions and another type of uh, these studies which are st st still going on and we are uh, um, scientists are taking it to the past in the deep time mostly they these studies are um, uh, taken up in the uh, in the eocene oligocene miocene sediments because because in these sediments uh, in, these plants from these areas Uh, can be more definitely correlated with the living forms so uh, so this another type of study is the clamp in which we try to study the length um, 
uh, statistical decoding the climatic signals by studying the how much long and broad that leaf is if is is it serrated or not and so all these characters are taken into consideration and on the basis of the of these character Uh, temper quantitative analysis is done. Ki how much pre uh, temp precipitation, how much uh, temperature was there in the past. So globally now uh, most of the scientists are trying to prepare the climatic zones and what was the temperature precipitation conditions were there during uh, Eo uh, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene time. Uh, and some of the researchers are now trying to uh, take it deep into time, uh, like right in, uh, right up to the Cretaceous, because as we go deep into the time, there is less probability of uh, um, uh, getting the fossils with it living relative. So better they are um, they are correlated with the living plants. Better assessment of their uh, climatic conditions can be done. so another important uh, proxy which is used in understanding the past climate is uh, that uh, dendrochronology or tree ring studies in which you know there are uh, every year uh, there is a ring and by counting the rings we can say that uh, how uh, many uh, means give the age of the of the uh, area or, or age of the wood and then there are these rings if we are wider rings in this part then it indicates that favorable conditions if they are closer rings then we we say there there was unfavorable conditions what are unfavorable condition favorable this is in terms of temperature moisture or cladonis conditions so so unfavorable favorable condition for the growth of the plant so these things can be assessed with the help of counting the tree rings and seeing the Width of the these strings in the tree trunks. So another uh, another important study which uh, which is carried out to understand the past climate conditions are the leaf margins. So in this you can see if it is uh, large leaves with smooth margins, then it is warmer climate, and if it's zigzag leaf with uh, with the So, bro, uh, means uh, exactly. Then it's known as uh, this considered as a cooler climate. So these studies are also taken into consider consideration while uh, and uh, taking to other fossils into con consideration and sediments. So these these flow of leaf uh, margin study or coexistence analysis or um, you can say li uh, nearest li li living relatives. They they tell about the. we can have more surety about the telling about the climatic conditions of the past since stomata stomata are also very important or leaf conditions if we have thinner cuticles then it, it indicates good amount of water if there is thicker cuticles less water because uh, plants will try to conserve water in that in that case they they will have uh, thicker cuticles if uh, uh, if co2 concentration is high then leaves of the plants they have more num uh, less number of stomata if uh, co2 concentration is less then uh, these stomata which are present the leaf they are uh, more so that uh, there will be more exchange of uh, gases uh, from the stomata the uh, number of stomata in the epidermal layers in the epidermis of leaves they are also very important in understanding the climatics for example in, if there is decrease in stomatal cells there is it indicates the means if there are less stomata this this indicates the less paleo temperature so so all these things are helpful in understanding the paleo climatic conditions as we all know this we have gondwana flora that gondwana flora was having uh, gondwana time india was attached and all these gondwana sediments they are having good coal deposits presence of coal itself indicates there was a lot of vegetation and if there is lot of vegetation this means that climate was good warm humid all these climates they are good for the growth of the vegetation so good growth of the vegetation itself indicates and formation of coal itself indicates that there is a good 
climate for the growth of the plants so pollen grains of the these gymnosperms because during gondwana times they were mostly gymnosperms and pteridophytic plants from this gondwa from this gymnosperms and pteridophytic plants most of the gondwana is found but from lignites we have angiosperm plants because lignite deposits are mostly found here in india in gujarat and uh, gujarat so that lignite is found by most dominated by angiosperm plants but gondwana coal is uh, uh, dominated by gymnosperm plants so if we have these gymnosperms they have one sacket you can see one sacus on the first and in the 12 number figures you can see the two sacs so if there is one sac like this then it indicates that there was a cold temperature conditions if sacs are like this then it's indicate the uh, growth of the plant uh, plants are growing in hot temperature conditions so on the basis of the sacs of the plants these studies are carried out by uh, bsip and they uh, on the study of the pollen grains recorded from the gondwana um, coal they have tried to interpret the climatic condition whether it's warm medium and you can see the Uh, means uh, deploxylidy or haploxylidy or they were sacs are leathery or the non leathery so these these things are uh, helpful in understanding the what what was the conditions during that time were the warm or cool or whatever it is so india indian plate as you all know that it's a very dynamic plate it uh, india has moved from the gondwana gondwana to its present position so when it moved from its present position it it, it crossed over um, uh, equator and uh, and then it uh, first there was volcanic activity deccan volcanic activity near 65 million years ago then it came near to the equator and then himalayan uh, himalayas were formed so all these um, uh, these uh, movement of indian plates caused climatic environmental changes on the indian plates and all these changes are preserved in the biota of the uh, during that period so as you know one of the important event that has taken place that is deccan volcanic activity um, obesar has already told about the extinction of dinosaurs and the possible cause of extinction of dinosaurs especially in india so this is deccan volcan uh, deccan volcanic province and it has infratrapians which were present below the arrival of the volcanic flows and intertrapians which are present in between the volcanic flows and all these intertrapians they have very good plants and uh, plants and animal fossils and these pl plants and animal fossils which we are trying to study to see the what was the impact of deccan volcanism on the these plants when climate change with the increasing volcanic activity on the deccan uh, continent uh, on the indian subcontinent so so all these uh, so uh, as uh, sir has already uh, um, described that uh, lights they are very good in understanding the what was the vegetation at that time vegetation is all dependent on climate and uh, and what was the feeding habit of the dinosaurs these studies can uh, these things can be assessed with the help of uh, vegetation during that time and this we have carried out studied on studying the uh, macerating the coprolites and seeing the vegetation so vegetation uh, during that time can be assessed with the help of coprolites so what was the floral diversity and vegetation and climate so all these things can be assessed with the help of study of plants of that time we are also studying the intertrapians we are seeing the how uh, with the changing climatic conditions plants have changed and these plants are directly dependent on climate so so all these things are interlinked together palynomorphs fossil woods fossils mega fossils micro fossils they all tell about the changing vegetation and changing vegetation is directly linked to the 
changing climate so all these things are uh, our studies are going on to understand the how climate has changed with the uh, uh deacon uh, deacon volcanic activity what was there in the in the onset of deacon volcanic uh, volcanic activity what happened when that deacon volcanic activity what at its peak and what happened when there was a decrease in the uh, vol volcanic activity so so uh, we we have done this study in the chinwara area so by studying the plants we could make out that there was change in uh, climatic conditions in time so not only uh, pelenomorphs these mega flora they are also very good indicator of of uh, past climate so on the basis of mega flora which which was recorded from deacon intertrapians uh, sediments the warm humid climate is ss so Uh, this uh, climatic conditions are also supported by the pelenoflora so india as india uh, was moving uh, from from south of equator to the north of equator and it undergone lot of environmental climatic change with the with the onset of volcanic activity so it is considered as also the very hotspot for the origin of the many, many angiosperm families so uh, as uh, uh, we have the oldest record of grasses from india we have oldest record records of grape fruits from india it is uh, these grapes they are recorded from from a uh, intertrapian locality very near to nagpur and uh, we have record of coconuts from mandla area then hibiscus my, my, uh, malve see this work we have already uh, means we, this is a paper we have already communicated and uh, so so this indicates that lot of because of these climatic environmental changes there was evolution of many angiosperm families in india and this indicates that from indian subcontinent these families migrated to other parts of the world and they also survived the um, cretaceous paleogene um, um, climatic changes so another important event of the indian subcontinent when it came very close to the uh, to the equator then there was a equatorial climate and we have lot of uh, lignite deposits in gujarat in uh, kutch in western uh, western ghats and uh, niveli lignite we all know that is it is considered as the largest lignite deposits of india so this lignites this indicates that there was a tropical climatic conditions pelenomorphs which from this uh, these lignite deposits which are from of paleocene eoc they indicate tropical rain forest in gujarat and uh, rajasthan area which are which are presently having distinctly different climatic conditions and there was also mangrove plants and so so these plants are now as as uh, study indicates that as india some of the plants which were growing when india was at the at the um, tropics are now present are not present in on the indian subcontinent they they uh, they could not survive the changed climatic monsoonal climatic conditions and uh, uh, they got extinct from the indian plate uh, and presently these plants are present in africa south america and um, uh, southeast asia which are enjoying the tropical climatic conditions so another important thing uh, studies that has been carried out by birbal sahani institute on the basis of phytoliths or silica remains which are present in the in uh, in the uh, grasses they are present in many plants but silica remains of grasses they are very much characteristics and they they can tell about the um, which to which grass they belong because we have all grasses maize uh, rice uh, 
uh, wheat, they all uh, different types of grasses. So they carried out this study from the Holocene and Gujarat, and they found that in the lower part, they they are uh, there was having cooler conditions, and at the upper part, they are having warmer conditions. So they interpreted that uh, that decline of Indus Valley civilization could be because of the decreasing southwest monsoon so this is another study that uh, plants can tell about the changing climatic conditions so plants are also tell about the about the changing coastlines because we have terrestrial distinctly terrestrial plants we have mangrove plants which grow very near to the coast and uh, we have uh, these dinoflagellates these are protest actually but they, they some of them can they prepare their own food so so by counting the concentration of terrestrial plants and marine uh, microorganisms we can tell about the changing coastline and changing coastline is also related to the um, to the climate change so coastline this type of study is very much done by ongc when they try to locate the uh, locate the uh, coastlines and because coastlines are the places where we have the source material for the um, development of petroleum so they are very much interested in uh, oil companies they are interested in uh, understanding the coastline so plants means pollen spores and dinosets concentration can very much tell about the changing coastline so so these uh, are in this way plants are also an indicator of coastline coastline indicates the past climates because increase and decrease is related to the monsoons so in short we can say that we study the uh, study the lithology we study the rocks and on the basis of these rocks we try to uh, palynomorphs or plants which are present in these rocks we, uh, we 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 know about the paleo diversity on the basis of the paleo diversity and quality of co plants present in the rocks we tries to assess the climatic paleo climatic condition whether temperate or desertic or tropical climatic conditions thank you very much thank you madam uh, i would is there any question I Ha ha! I would like to request parti participants to ask questions with any. Participants? So no questions. <laughs> so. No one dares you ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> or it can be otherwise. They couldn't understand. <laughs> no. No, so, no, madam, no, one, no. one question: uh, stoma stomata. No, yeah. you talked about stomata. Stomata yeah. and the uh, carbon dioxide concentration. How how you just interpret it? That that have already to the, the concentration of stomata. If there are more stomata, then there there this shows that less CO two concentration and temperature conditions are also indicated. What kind of uh, trees are there? Plants are so there? actually that is very much dependent on if we can assess correlate with the living. Then then also we can say much better about the conditions because we will study the past concentration of stomata of the past plants and present day plants so generally correlation with the living is very important for 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 understanding the co2 concentration and other things okay. I think, uh, thank you very much, madam. Now I request uh, Dr. Samaya Hume to propose a uh, word of thanks. I think, uh, are you there? 
Yes. Uh, should I start? Yeah, you can start. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is one question. I could see. Can I take question or shall we go ahead? Uh, you may take question. Uh, madam, there is one question for ah, you. Okay, okay. How paleo studies can help overcome the problem of global warming? Wazul Khan here has asked the question. Paleo, actually, globe, present day uh, global warming, it's different thing. But we, we, we just try to see what was the climate in the past. And if we know what is the climate in the past, and since as, as a geologist, we all know that um, climate has changed in the past many times. We, Earth has seen many, uh, many changes in the climate. And if we study the biodiversity, we can understand the, this was the biodiversity at that time. Uh, suppose if we are seeing the Deacon, Deacon, Deacon time, the Deacon time, there were there were many forms which appeared, like I say that grasses they appeared, vitaceae family grapes they appeared, and there are some of the plant they they also got extinct. So if we want to st uh, by studying the past climate, we can say that up to what extent we climate can change and how much biodiversity ca can change with the changing climatic conditions of the today so understanding the past climate is significantly important to telling about the future how much change can takes place takes place with the changing climatic conditions because plants are the very good indicator of the changing climatic conditions so we see the greenhouse effect and all that. Earth has seen many greenhouse effects, but it is not that everything got extinct. It is not that uh, nothing new came up. It is the it's a global changing pattern. Okay, I think uh, this is uh, sufficient for. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for your answer. Uh, over to Dr. Samia now for final vote of thanks. There is presentation of Dr. Samia Humni also. Yes, ma'am, but I think I should skip because it is already 5.30, 5.45 in fact. So uh, everyone is exhausted and uh, we reduced to half of the participants. So better, I, I, will be recording, I will be recording my presentation and uploading on YouTube channel. Will it be fine? No, I have been the biggest beneficiary of this. I have been attending it right from the morning of three different chapters. <laughs> 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 All the day throughout the day doing, I think, multitasking. So many, <laughs> and there is some painting also going on in the house. So, okay. <laughs> really, <laughs> anyway, that's yeah. very interesting and very nice. So much of enthusiasm. All the best. Uh, Please. Okay, so, so, uh, so, I will be uploading my talk uh, on the YouTube link, which I've already provided to the participants. So at the end, very warm evening to all distinguished uh, scientists, research scholars, and student friends. Myself on behalf of uh, Paleontological Society of India, Nagpur chapter, Gunwana Geological Society, uh, Nagpur, and Alumni Association of PG Department of Geology, like to thank all of you for your precious time and active participation. I, on my personal behalf, like to thank Dr. M. P. Singh, President, Paleontological Society of India, Dr. Shubhi Shukla, Vice President, and Dr. V. P. Mishra, Secretary, Paleontological Society of India, for giving us the opportunity to organize this event and also for considering our request regarding change of dates frequently. My sincere thanks to Dr. A. K. Chatterjee, President, Gondwana Geological Society, Dr. P. P. Sarulka, Secretary, Gondwana Geological Society, and also office bearers of Alumni Association of PG Department of Geology, RTM Nagpur University, Nagpur, for allowing us to take this event from their platform. I am also thankful to all the distinguished speakers, Dr. D. M. Mohabe, Dr. Sayyad Azruddin, Dr. Arindam Chakrabarti, Dr. Bandana Samant, for giving their consent to deliver their very lucid and enlightening talks in very short intimation of time. I'd like to thank all the participants for giving their very precious three hours of time for listening to us. 
My special thank is also due to Mr. Melin Dakapi, Director GSI Central Region GSI Nagpur, for providing their timely logistic help on a single phone call. I like to thank all the very respected faculty members of our department, Professor P. Kundal, Professor M. Pohle, Mr. M. Varade, Dr. B. S. Mandre, Dr. Y. M. Urkute, Dr. M. S. Deshmukh, Dr. Himan Khandari for their help and support. I like to thank our local organizing committee for their efforts in organizing this event online. Thank you everyone who helped us directly or indirectly in organizing and making this event a grand success. Thank you everyone. And I'd like to inform to all the participants that uh, the feedback form link will be provided on our uh, Gondwana Geological Society's website and on all the groups where the flyer has been circulated. Thank you, everyone. And thank I will take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Samia, for um, providing us this opportunity and organizing this great event. You have taken a lot of pains bringing all of us together on a common platform. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much. Thank and you, wish you Thank all you, sir. Happy Thank Diwali you. to everyone. Yeah, wonderfully done. <laughs> happy Diwali. Thank happy Diwali, Diwali, to happy Diwali to everyone. Happy Thank Diwali, you. Diwali to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy, yeah, sir. Hope we meet soon. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.